We have a, a very uh, uh, busy uh, session. We have, besides our speakers, we're going to start with some some uh, entertainment. And of course, everybody knows the topic today is the Winnipeg general strike 100 years on. So before we call upon our panel, we're going to call upon our very, very good friend and, and comrade, uh, uh, hip hop, Muhammad Ali. So go for it, brother. Okay. Uh, you don't need Actually, yeah, no, no, no. How's everybody doing? Uh, so uh, yesterday, uh, it was a very long couple days. I, the day before, I woke up at 5 in the morning, came to the city for Jurassic Park, 7 in the morning, all day. It was, I got to that 3 a.m. And then yesterday, um, I performed at the uh, Women of Distinction event at Queen's Park uh, for the injured workers uh, movement, uh, and then came straight running here. Uh, came in, uh, saw John and Suzanne, who were sitting right over there. Uh, totally missed that, that Sid was in the room. Um, and then I, I came here and I was like, oh my god, Sid Ryan, I've never had a chance to full, like properly thank you uh, for like all the work you did that you know built so much uh, labor in labor, the labor movement in Ontario uh, that really helped shape my album. And I, I tried to wing it last night because, you know, I just, just, uh, just saw Sid. But uh, this morning I just want to talk about how my album was made before I share a couple pieces with y'all. My album was really made. And we're like, how'd you come up with this stuff? How'd you come up with these stories? And it's literally, you know, going, you know, to the, the Stalco rally, uh, the, the Caterpillar rally, uh, you know, sitting there with seniors who are shutting down uh, MP, 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 MP offices, um, you know, trying to save pensions, and having these one-on-one -on -one conversations with folks, one-on-one -on -one conversation with a taxi driver, with a Starbucks worker, those conversations, you know, at movement events, you know, in, you know, while grabbing a coffee, you know, really are the stories that are told in Labor of Love, and a lot of those stories, you know, wouldn't be there if it wasn't for Sid Ryan. And um, like I had mentioned yesterday, Sid uh, actually got me uh, to write a piece called The Ontario We Want, uh, even did a full music video for it, and got to debut it at convention. I remember I was doing community organizing work at George Brown College on Monday morning, and my t Twitter started exploding, and I was like, what is going on here? And uh, because they opened up the convention uh, before Sid's speech with playing the music video, and uh, you know, it was one of the you know, real highlights um, of my career as a young, up-and-coming progressive artist. So, uh, one more time, Sid, thank you for everything you do for all of us. Uh, now, this is not official yet, but I've since been able to do another um, uh, OFL uh, convention theme song, and possibly, um, you know, I uh, ran to somebody who said, maybe, you know, we might call on you to do one again um, this time, and I've been, you know, now that the album's done, I've been doing some writing, so I decided to just put a little something together that may, may be used by the OFL. If not, I'll definitely be using it uh, for my own work. This one right here is called The Power of Many, and it goes a little something like this. And my first time ever performing this piece. I just wrote it not too long ago. The power of the many, we the strong, not the few. And that means me, but it also means you and you and you and you and you. Power of the many, strong, not the few. The power of the many, we the strong, not the few. And that means me, but it also means you and you and you and you. Power of the many, strong, not the few. When it goes from me to we, that's solidarity. Workers uniting and fighting for prosperity. No to us, arity, because that's just parlor tricks. We need change for the people, not for parlor tricks. We need a rise for our people, the next door neighbors, child care workers teaching toddlers and daycares, high school students walking out in protest for those those on the margins whose struggles go unnoticed. We the people will fight for public services, rise for what's right, and always uplift justice. It's not just us people power, we got plenty. We the workers, we the power, we the power of many. We the people, we won't surrender. We the power, when we're together. We the people, we won't surrender. We the power. Strength in numbers, the power of the many, we the strong, not the few. And that means me, but it also means you and you and you and you and you. Power of the many, strong, not the few. We the power of the many, we the strong, not the few. And that means me, but it also means you and you and you and you and you. The power of the many, we're the strong, not the few.
Well, one, one more small speech before one last piece. Again, uh, another piece that I've only performed once at uh, the recent OCAP event where the rich people were dining under the gardener. Uh, <laughs> Eat the rich. That. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I, performed, I performed that piece uh, there. But before that, I just want to talk about uh, May Day this year. Um, so I've, I've done uh, a few May Day events uh, on, on May 1st. And that week, my daughter, who's four, some of you may have met her at rallies or seen her on stage with me, was having a bit of a rough week, um, and there were some issues. And the weekend of uh, May Day, the weekend of the 4th and the 5th, I came to find out that things were a little worse because what I was seeing at home, I co-parent, so I, she's not around me every day, she's around me half the time. And some of the stuff when she wasn't around me um, was being brought out, and it kind of hit me like a ton of bricks because it just came out of nowhere on a Friday night. And it was one of those things where you got with self-care first, sometimes with family first. Um, and I wasn't able to follow through on my many uh, Friday night and Saturday afternoon and Saturday evening events, including the Socialist Action uh, May Day celebration, which you know I've been you know lucky to be a part of for so many years in a row. Um, ended up sitting, you know, as a family, we sat down with my little one on the Sunday morning for the past month. She has just been amazing. Uh, she has like work through these issues like taking the lead like mom and dad are following well you know and as a four-year-old you know uh, really taking hold and doing amazing and now that she is doing amazing a month later you know I, I you know I'm comfortable sharing uh, what happened but so for those of you that were there um, at, at the May Day celebration for social action I heard it was an amazing night um, and I apologize for not being there and hopefully you will see me next May and and and, and 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 Amira will be five and a half by then. Maybe she'll, and she'll come. maybe she'll join Dad again. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so having having said that, um, this piece is really close to my heart. And this piece uh, for those who have my email or need my contact, you know, Liz, Barry, Julius can always provide you my email. Um, I, I wrote a piece that I really like, especially when you hear it with music. It's very feels like a very Rage Against the Machine, Public Enemy, yeah. old school rock, hip hop, anti racism anthem. I really believe in this record, and I think it's really good. But I'm sitting here, and I'm going to write second and third and fourth drafts because I think, you know, if I perfect this, this can be one that goes really far, and it's obviously very timely. So, and I'm, I'm going to try to do a little bit of crowd participation. Again, this is a, it's a piece that's still a work in progress, but I think you're going to love it. Uh, I need y'all, when I point to you, to say, Afraid again! Afraid, Afraid again. again! Afraid again! Afraid again! Alright, so let's, let's try it out. We gotta make racist! Afraid, Afraid again! again. MAGA hat racist! Afraid, Afraid again! We gotta make racist! Afraid again! MAGA hat racist! Afraid again! We gotta make racist! Afraid again! MAGA hat racist! Afraid again! We gotta make Racist. Afraid again. Maga hat racist. Afraid again. First verse ain't a sermon. Its purpose is to service. Racists who asserted that they never would serve us. Seeing every person in a turban as a serpent, making certain we they servants, making curtains under serfdom. We've been Plymouth Rock, El Haj Malik Shabazz. We've been Standing Rock, no pipeline on this path. We've been Willie Lynch, that's W.B. Du Bois. The lesson of oppression lies in whys and hows. Mike Pence in the White House got the kids in cages. Mike Brown got gunned down with no explanation. So with no hesitation, yes, we the forsaken. For too long we've been waiting, so we're here for the taking. Taking those who sit in silence to task, we're taking. Taking on white pride worldwide, we're taking. Taking on all Nazi scumbags, we're taking back what's ours. Taking back what's ours. Gotta make racist. Afraid again. MAGA half racist. Afraid again. We gotta make racist. Afraid again. MAGA half racist. Afraid again. We gotta make racist. Afraid again. MAGA half racist. Afraid again. We gotta make. Racist, afraid again. Maga half racist, afraid again. If you love to hate, man, you're clueless. I don't hate the hate, man, that's useless. I hate the hate that hate produces, because hate is abusive, so here's what the truth is. Yes, the truth is subjective, but if it subjugates justice, that's a tool of convenience that's corrupted. And if you won't correct it, then yeah, you guessed it. The, the truth is, if the racist shoe fits, wear it. I got brown skin in the game, this ain't a joke, no fairy tale. The emperor wears no clothes. I can see it what it's for, but I can also see hope. If y'all with me, shout out in support. If you with me, put every racist in their place so they got no escape. Make them cower in disgrace. Make racists afraid. Refugees feel safe. Make no mistake. Make these racists afraid. We gotta make racists afraid, afraid again. again. MAGA hat racists afraid, afraid again. again. Gotta make racists afraid again. MAGA hat racists afraid, afraid again. again. Blackface racists afraid again. Build a wall racists afraid again. Fox News racist, TV George again. racist, Proud Boy again. racist, MAGA hat racist, make racists afraid again. 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 Yeah. Woo! <laughs>
very long two days. I'm going to go take an afternoon nap. <laughs> That's what parents do. Comrades, have an amazing conference. Th thank you again. One more time for Sid. <laughs> Peace, love, solidarity. Thank you very much, comrade. Enjoy the rest of your day. Okay, so the next next uh, item on the, this part of the agenda is a poem by George Eliot Clark, and is going to be read by Barry. Of course, it's about the Winnipeg general strike. Good thing. Indeed. Do you want to hold that mic? Or do you want to? No, I'll leave it on. The, raise it up. It's fine. <laughs> Are you going to stand right here? Yeah, I could stand here. Can you hear me at the back? Yeah. Yes. Okay, good stuff. It actually is better when you hold the mic closer. <laughs> you want to flip my pages? <laughs> you may be surprised to learn that I did not write this book. But I am delighted to... Uh, to read it. It's by George Eliot Clark, who is the Poet Laureate of Toronto, 2012 to 2015, and of course it's dedicated to this anniversary of the Winnipeg General Strike. Gussied up money bags, penny-pinching misers, and gimlet-eyed moneylenders, the pinstripe suit vampires, and happy hour cannibals, the well-dressed and sulky prudes, the scumbag molochs, plumped up parasites, plutocrats whose bureaucracy renders democracy bankrupt kleptop kleptocracy, where workers are monetized. Sweat's worth gold, but sweat never overpowers gold, never frustrates the omni omnipotence of gold, where workers hoard ale and bosses hoard gold, where landlords hound workers to cough up dough and won't be buffaloed, can't be appeased where VIPs, sphincters, fart excuses, much muck to mull over, so-so mouthfuls as personages talk trash and write garbage. Spit out bullshit and write up filth and ink a lot of dirt to back war profiteers who count corpses, to back conspirators fixing bread prices behind boardrooms' oak doors, to back laws that frame workers as fresh serfs, not citizens, more like cannon fodder, than consumers, and to back the preachers who tell the poor the word of God is bread. Enough to feast on prayers, become well fed on thou shalt nots, well versed in black robed cant, that lyrical Latinate patina. Bamboozling, sidelining, maligning, casting the downtrodden as slobs, crooks, drunks, addicts, hobos, having only themselves to blame, being so unfriendable, being so unlettered, who need accept Insistent, insistently sour lectures, the animalish grunt, crude grunts of lawyerly gangsters, those who parade as legislators, whose laws foster prejudices, invent outlaws, each perceptibly a bottom feeder. Big cigars in the big mouths and big heads, the bass dudes lisping poisonously, next adding claptrap, then next utter bullshit. The pure pollution, plain cyanide, of the supply and demand of meatless soup and saltless gruel of wine gone vinegar so poor souls chew fried cabbage boiled cabbage roots chestnuts beans fibrous rubbish porridge fried potatoes boiled potatoes not else friends constitute sorry, fiends constitute the state who institute destitution whose wheeling dealing is prostitution laissez-faire predators debauched, sewage-stuffed brains, assholes and schmucks, all as durable as hard, cold, old cash, soundly invested in blue chips, stocks, bonds. This bourgeois state is the worker's prison. It pits the well-heeled against the sans-culotte, the bare-assed whose toggery is ripped rags. Here capital inks the laws and cuts the checks. For politicos, and all the working class efforts to better their lives, to evolve beyond the struggle to breathe and, to, and eat seem tantamount to launching a civil war. Winnipeg, May, June, 1919. Revolutionary she always was. Winnipeg, the prairie's gilt capital. The golden boy capping the provincial parliament mirrors Paris's Bastille. Statuary, like Louis Riel's Métis rebelled, revolted, so unstoppably, versus John A. MacDonald, they founded Manitoba. But the next rebellion, 
got put down while Riel got hanged. But no one could deny the Paris Commune brought home. The example that 1870 set for Paris, Prairie Paris, the Bastille, the rebellion, the Commune, foretelling the next civil war between bosses and employees, the combat dividing Crescentwood mansions and North End hovels, the grain exchange and Vulcan iron facing down plebes wanting one big union, no more waffling about wobblies, and enough dough to have enough daily bread, and the state, to not side with dollars always, to not be swayed by the full weight of gold, or gold turned lead, gone ferocious, gone to bullets, and to grant the returned men, the veterans, reprieve from imperialist jackals, their suspect accretion of war booty. Who just shipped 5,000 Canuck Marines to Vladivostok, Russia, to put down Lenin, the Bolshevik Revolution, capital so, capital so murderous and gruesome? No more syndicates vindicated. The Winnipeg workers will strike against the rich folks' Reich will strike down their thieving, strike against this gothic dystopia. Suddenly, the telephones lost perfume. The hello girls are warbling, yet plugs pulled. Milk carts and bread carts retire their horses until the strike committee lets them clop foodstuffs from door to door to keep households nourished because half the addresses house a striker. Now firefighters light cigarettes. Streetcar drivers ride bikes. Mailmen become singing messengers. Cooks desert kitchens. Waiters toss away their aprons. Barbers set down their clippers. Railway men stay home. Suddenly, there's no mail, no telegrams, no streetcars, no taxis, no newspapers. 30,000 Winnipeggers are on strike. It's the Paris Commune. It's the prelude to Paris in May 1968. It's almost revolution that sparks sympathy strikes across the Dominion. Now cometh Andrews into the picture and his citizens' committee of 1,000 a bunch of tycoons and, and, <clears throat> and grifters who fired the police force who wouldn't fire on strikers and deputized goons, frank thugs, as special constables, gangbangers bought to, bought to bash heads with baseball bats, bring on drums, bugles, brandish guns, bring on bloodshed, yells. Lewis machine guns are shipped in, sights are set, paraded about, aimed from the opera house, just in case, are not used. But they're there. Andrews, yellow-bellied, jaundiced, yellow press, shouts dank, dingy lies, damns the strikers as Bolsheviks. The federal justice, justice minister, is warned that the strike could spread, birth a Canuck Soviet. And Andrews cartoons the strike leaders as seditious conspirators who must be, with gusto, handcuffed, imprisoned, and fast deported. The strike leaders weaken their own support by grumbling that the diverse exodus out of Europe, shipping Jew and German and Ukrainian and Pole and Britain to Winnipeg, threatens returned men's jobs. But labor's vilifying of migrants strengthens Andrews, who claims the strike leaders themselves are alien scum, deserving exile to be kicked out of Canada. Soon, his de facto provisional state, whose only good is fertile defecate, sees ten strike leaders cuffed and charged and caged while federales occupy the streets. When strikers congregated to protest oppression, the Northwest Mounted Police rampaged, trampled, struck as if medieval inquisitors or as if pursuing Riel, forerunner radical his ghost, risen incarnate at Saint Boniface. And the cops slew two strikers, right stone dead. And bullied and clobbered and shackled some dozens, so that the strike, stymied, stalled, stilled. But diplomacy must fail against death. To have won would have meant non-stop ruction. Wisdom is perpetual consciousness of history. So history is always in the present tense and the first person. So history demands that we extend the general strike. 
if utopia is true equality of citizens. Once we strike down the banker's state, once we complete what Winnipeg began. Thank you, comrade. So the last part of the cultural uh, part of this session is a song. Um, it's playing a new song about the strike. So somebody's going to put that on. discovered in their absence they'd got the sack tenements and squalor both rats and people getting sick what they had in common life was short death was quick no one had a plan what they were going to do when all the men came back home in the ranks of the unemployed crew the way the people had to live was no life at all but it still came as a surprise how many hands of the call if you weren't there you'll never know just what it was like when the whole city went on strike city leaders and newspapers in many ways they tried to do everything they could to widen the divide between good Canadians and those they called alien scum between those who missed conscription and those who beat the war drum but when the veterans marched in Winnipeg they marched for everyone under the banner of the working class the one big union everybody left their jobs whether organized or not even the policemen walked away refused to embrace the rod and you were there you'll never know just what it was like when the whole city went on strike deputized the scabs soon they shot two men who died in the city center on the hour when the scabs rampaged through the city attacking anyone in the street trapping people in alleyways not even allowing them to retreat soldiers occupied the city people hadn't eaten in weeks the prospects for victory began to look bleak people went back to their jobs if indeed they even could the bosses said they'd seek revenge and many of them would if you weren't there you'll never know just what it was like when the whole city went on strike strike leaders were imprisoned from where several were elected to the Canadian Parliament and a monument was erected at Main and Portage where a streetcar was overturned driven in by strike breakers on the spot where it was burned it was a century ago but life is often still defined by which side you were on on that picket line was your grandpa shot in the heart or did they break his leg when the working class rose up and shut down Winnipeg if you weren't there you'll never know just what it was like when the whole city went on strike if you weren't there you'll never know just what it was like when the whole city went on strike 
Drake when the whole city went on strike. Who was the artist? David Robbins. David who? Robbins. David. Rodex. Okay. Okay. Thanks, comrade, for holding up that banner. Okay. So now we're going to call our our speakers, our panelists up. So I think we all know by now what the, what the panelists are going to talk about. <laughs> I think it's all been said. Okay. All right, so our speakers, our speakers today, our first speaker will be Brian Palmer, who is a labor historian, a past chair of the Canadian Studies Department at Trent University, and the author of the forthcoming book, James P. Cannon and the Emergence of Trotskyism in the United States, 1928 to 1938. He is also the author of books on the origins of the American revolutionary left and the early years of American communism. Our second speaker, will be uh, Gary Porter. He's a past leader of the Chartered Professional Accountants of Canada, but his political life is much more interesting. <laughs> right, Gary? Gary was the organization secretary and executive secretary of the League for Socialist Action in the 1970s. And he is now, and we're proud to say so, a leading member of Socialist Action resident on Vancouver Island. And our third speaker, is Brother Sid Ryan. He's the past president of the Ontario Federation of Labour and before that president of the Canadian Union of Public Employees Ontario. Five times Sid was a candidate for the NDP in provincial and federal elections. He is the author of the, the political memoirs who I've been advertising this book right here, A Grander Vision, My Life in the Labour Movement, just published by Dundurn Press. Sid is speaking on this panel today due to a family event that prevents him from being here for the 4 o'clock one. And he's also told me that he's probably got to leave by 2, but he's going to stay as long as he can. So if you see him leave, it's nothing we're saying. He's just got to go. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Brian. Uh, well, thanks very much. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here and an honor to be on the panel with uh, Gary and Sid. And I'll speak... Um, you can do the first. If you can do the first one, I'll try to communicate with our. Uh, yeah. Mike, Mike, can you not hear me in the back? No, uh, I got the light. The lights. There we are. Uh, I, I doubt I need it much. Uh, you can hear it in the back, can't you? Yeah. Good. Okay. Okay. I'm going to going to really speak about 1919 and recovering the legacy of the Winnipeg General Strike, and I'll try to basically uh, outline some of the dimensions of the strike and I've cut out some comments on the labor movement today because I thought Sid would be more appropriate to comment on them if that's what you're, you're, you're going to be talking about. Um, let's start with the notion that in 1919 all the world was watching Winnipeg. Alexander Bittleman, a Jewish immigrant and a left-wing activist in New York Socialist Party, uh, recalled the impact of the Winnipeg General Strike in May of 1919. The feeling, he said, was an, of, of an approaching storm. It especially aroused all people in my circles, where the Canadian events were much discussed as part of the widespread strike struggle unfolding as the left wing was taking shape. There were eloquent indications that things were coming to a showdown, Bittleman recalled. Militants prepared themselves to take the lead, and they created organizations that might bring about the much heralded new dawn of a workers' revolt. In Glasgow, the Scottish Lennon, John McLean of the of Red Clydeside, saw the great Canadian strike as nothing less than a class war on an international scale. From Turin's Factory Council movement, Winnipeg elicited, elicited similar kinds of comments. Antonio Gramsci thought the Canadian uprising part of a new revolutionary tide, a world-scale tsunami that promised the realization of a Soviet order. Comment in leading newspapers in the United States seemed to agree. Chicago's Daily Tribune uh, headlines declared all Winnipeg under Soviet rule. New York <laughs> Times editorials bemoaned the strike fever was sweeping the West. The general strike, it declared, was an attempt at revolution and imitation of Soviet autocracy. Um, 
The strike, in fact, grew out of fairly commonplace agitations, things that we would ta t today take for granted, of course. Basically, building tradesmen and metal trades workers kicked things off at the end of April and the beginning of May in 1919. They mainly wanted wage improvements in the eight-hour day. They asked for industry-wide bargaining uh, rather than employer-specific negotiations, which basically uh, reduced workers to sort of going cap in hand to employers and asking in each particular plant, sometimes on an individual basis, for this or that kind of wage <coughs> negotiation. Um, capital closed its ears to the workers' demands in the metal trade shops, for instance. 25 of 28 employers ignored entirely workers' appeals in 1919. They simply refused to meet with them and make any concessions. As these struggles simmered, telephone operators, street railway workers, and even a policeman's association were embroiled, embroiled in discussions about the conditions of work and wages in various employment sectors. Tensions mounted uh, as bosses and their organizations uh, and business associations dug in the heels of class resistance. The arrest of a militant worker, uh, revelations that employers were uh, paying labor spies uh, to report on union meetings, and rumors that the government was uh, bankrolling agents provocateurs up the conflictual ante and heightened tensions. At a 13, 13 May 1919 Trades and Labor Council meeting, Winnipeg's organized workers heard that the city's unions had voted 11,000 to 500 in favor of declaring a general strike. Bob Russell, a leading figure in the Canadian Pacific Railway uh, unit of the International Association of Machinists, and an ardent socialist, anti-war activist, and eventual campaigner for the One Big Union, urged workers for, to, quote, take no more defeats. Mass walkouts commenced on the 15th of May in 1919, Within days, 35,000 workers were on strike, and Winnipeg's population of 175,000 was entirely polarized. I mean, if you're talking 35,000 workers, you associate those with families, you've got basically half the people actively engaged in strikes, and that doesn't include all the people who were supporting them and were, were a part of the movement. Many of the strikers, uh, if you go to the next slide, many of the strikers were, uh, um, uh, immigrant workers, largely confined to uh, very poor living conditions in the North End. The next, next one. Uh, uh, they were they were not so much affiliated with the powerful craft unions, the unions of specific trades, uh, whose memberships were made up of skilled workers, largely of British descent, and whose discontents had in fact sparked the labor walkouts to begin with. But the immigrant community was linked to the respectable, quote unquote, Anglo Canadian workers and the leadership of the strike through common sensibilities, especially evident uh, in, uh, in overlapping networks of socialist publications and associations. Um, the strike would take on a very anti immigrant character as well as an anti labor character as a consequence. Winnipeg's general strike and the need to defend it against attack resonated with workers across Canada. A wave of sympathetic strikes rocked the country. The body politic reacted as though it was being attacked by a disease which was soon demonized in the public press and the mainstream media and throughout the political culture with the designation Winnipegitis. <laughs> um, it was a, in a brief three month period from May to July 1919 200 workplace uh, walkouts took place involving over 115,000 men and women, and more than 30 sympathetic uh, job actions erupted from Amherst, Nova Scotia, to Victoria, British Columbia, with workers walking off the job uh, simply to declare their support for their Winnipeg brothers and sisters. The radical leader of the Nova Scotia miners, J.B. McLaughlin, called on the Trades and Labor Congress of Canada to create a nationwide general strike to defend the freedoms of speech and association of the Winnipeg workers. Women, if they were not striking themselves in Winnipeg, were often sustaining militancy through women's labor <coughs> leagues. A Winnipeg uh, leader of these strikes, uh, Helen uh, Jury Armstrong, was the daughter of a longtime Toronto labor activist, Alfred Jury, whose history in the labor movement reached back to the struggles of the 1870s and the 1880s. Ma Armstrong, as Helen was affectionately known, would be arrested for her leadership role in the Winnipeg General Strike 
And it needs to be pointed out that the first strikers to actually walk out of their workplaces on the 15th of May at 7 a.m. in the morning uh, were the telephone operators. Um, who were known as the hello girls, but were sometimes colloquially referred to as call girls. Um, women's concerns were articulated in a new dialect of defi uh, dialectic, dialect pardon me, of defiance. Uh, Rosina uh, Azals of the Regina Women's Labor League, for instance, declared, let the working man, the one who produces, have control, and then we will see the light of a new dawn. Saskatoon's uh, Miss Francis insisted plundering must cease, profiteering must go. This was an attack on kind of wartime. Uh, activities of employers. The larger uh, hopes of the people, she said, had to take precedence over the money interests. Um, she concluded production for use must predate, replace production for profit. And this was indeed a radical rallying cry in 1919. Rose Henderson of Montreal proclaimed the real revolution, as she said, is the mother, not the man. She says openly, there is nothing but revolution for her. Radical Winnipegitis advocates soon faced, of course, the opposition of conservative counterparts within the upper echelons of organized labor's bureaucracy. The Canadian Brotherhood of Railway Employees head, Aaron Mosher, got in on, an, on what was a growing anti-general strike act. He volunteered his services to Prime Minister Borden. He noted that his trade union movements, uh, members uh, in the railways, on the railways, were striking even after he had denied them official authorization to go out. The rank and file in the labor movement, Mosher proclaimed, were forcing the leaders to take the stand that they have now taken. An, an AFL official in, in the United States complained that the militant workers of the Canadian West wanted nothing short of a transfer of the means of production from that of private control to that of collective ownership. Winnipegitis was a plague on both the bourgeois house of order then and the officially recognized house of labor. Capital and the state recoiled from the uh, escalating class conflict of 1919's Winnipegitis in fear and loathing. The Royal Northwest Mounted Police reports indicated that returned working class soldiers were lining up behind socialists. A memorandum on revolutionary tendencies in the Canadian West warned of a general state of restlessness and dissatisfaction with left-wing agitators being the foam on the wave of an uncertain, apprehensive, and nervous proletarian temper that was growing more threatening by the day. If the state would uh, pass appropriate legislation, the Royal Northwest Mounted Police Commissioner Bowen Perry was prepared to deport 100 dangerous aliens uh, in early June taking the revolutionary wind out of the uh, sort of insurgent sails of a defiant Winnipeg working class. Banded together in the Citizens Committee of 1,000, Winnipeg's elite peppered politicians like Borden and the Minister of Labor, Gideon Robertson, or the Acting Minister of Justice, Arthur Meehan, with, uh, um, good, um, uh, with uh, appeals to save Canada from the supposed Bolshevik revolution that gripped Winnipeg. Nothing drove the Patrician Committee to exasperation more than the general strike flaunting its power. And a symbol of this was that the general strike committee issued placards uh, permitted by authority of the strike, uh, which were sort of uh, the, the way in which milk wagons and, and other essential services were actually delivered to people in need. And this was defiantly not the prerogative of lowly tradesmen and uneducated immigrants as a concrete expression of how the world was turned upside down in May of 1919. Uh, the posted declaration that some activity had been permitted by authority of the strike committee proclaimed a proletarian order that defied conventional capitalist relations. The citizen body of 1,000, proudly declaring itself as the 1% in its own name, <laughs> demanded an end to the presumptuous sort of rule of workers. A return to private property-based governance was demanded. If this took an influx of troops, declarations of martial law, amendments to the criminal code, deportations of radical aliens, mass arrests, and state trials, so be it. Much of this happened. Gideon Robertson dismissed the striking postal workers who refused Ottawa's dictate that they return to work. Almost 250 city cops were freed for were were fired, pardon me, for sympathizing with the strikers. The Citizens Committee recruited an army of businessmen, the special police, uh, 
great. <laughs> the special police, over 1,000 strong to patrol the streets, and riots ensued. Meehan condemned the revolutionists of various types, from crazy idealists, he said, down to ordinary thieves. His paranoia about Bolshevism and socialism running rampant throughout Canada was legendary. He even called on the British government to station a warship off of Vancouver to serve as a steadying influence, he said, on the turbulent politics of the immediate post-World War II period. Between the 16th and the 21st of June, with the strike now basically a month old, the Royal Northwest Mounted Police raided halls and strike leaders' homes. The Labor Temple and the offices of the Western Labor News, the newspaper of the strikers, were ransacked. Arrests of Russ R. B. Russell and other Anglo-Saxon leaders, as well as immigrant workers who, who were targeted for de deportation, resulted in a countrywide protest movement and a series of demonstrations. The Special Police and the Mounties attacked a silent parade of worker protest, the event memorialized as Bloody Saturday. Um, here's some returned soldiers speaking to a crowd. Um, injuries abounded. Almost 100 workers were arrested uh, on Bloody Saturday. One striker, Mike Solikowski, lay dead as the gendarmes fired into the crowd. Another, Mike Chernoboskwich, later succumbed to gang gangrene infections, and he died from his wounds. After six weeks of struggle, and with the Citizens Committee calling the shots, uh, yeah, we're back, or we can go to the next one. I think. That's me. Um, <laughs> after six weeks of struggle and the Citizens Committee calling the shots, uh, federal power was decisively arrayed against the strikers, and the massive walkout was ended on the 26th of June, 1919. The General Strike Committee urged Winnipeg wor workers to speak in no uncertain terms of the next municipal election. A worried Trades and Labor con Congress organizer breathed a sigh of relief that the Winnipegitis epidemic had been quarantined. Labor's defeat was, he hoped, an inoculation against the threatening danger of revolutionary industrial unionism. There was never a his uh, a his in history a strike in which the workers answered the call so spontaneously, he wrote, and there was never a strike in which the workers were so badly trimmed. Um, with the Immigrant Act compliantly revised by the federal state to allow for deportation of foreign-born strikers without trial and without presentation of evidence justifying banishment, the persecution uh, of, of the moment was largely in the hands of the Citizens Committee and its leader, A.J. Andrews. A number of ethnic workers arrested on Bloody Saturday found themselves whisked off to northern Ontario camps near Kapuskasing and awaiting deportation to Germany, Russia, and elsewhere. Four of the more prominent of these ostensibly dangerous foreigners were imprisoned in Winnipeg without bail. Deportation hearings were conducted through the Immigration Board rather than through a formal trial. And two of these Canadian-born socialists, Samuel Bloomberg and Oscar Chapelleri, were deported. Ten English-speaking British-born strike leaders, James, including James Woodsworth, the future founder of the Cooperative Commonwealth Federation, Bob Russell, William Ivins, Abraham Hinks, Roger Bray, that picture of the uh, um, uh, uh, soldier, soldier uh, addressing the crowd was Roger Bray. Uh, William Pritchard and others were ultimately charged uh, by the state uh, with either seditious conspiracy to overthrow the government or uh, seditious libel. The state, these state trials conducted over the last half of 1919 resulted in three acquittals, Woodsworth, Dixon, and Heaps, and seven convictions which carried prison terms ranging from six months to two years. The trials led to the formation of Winnipeg, a Winnipeg Defense Committee, and this committee convened a convention of protest. 600 delegates determined to undertake legal appeals to sustain the families of the incarcerated comrades with monthly payments of $35 and to continue to propagandize about the Winnipeg general strike. Um, conservative historians have long held that the Winnipeg general strike was nothing more than a collective bargaining dispute gone wrong. It was fought out in their eyes over mundane issues of work and wages. The May-June conflict was elevated to a Bolshevik insurrection by politicians who panicked and by self-serving capitalists. Radicals were, in this view, uh, an irksome thorn in the overly tender side of a regime of acquisitive individualism, but the whole thing just got out of hand. 
Well, there's some truth in that. It wasn't the Bolshevik Revolution that the bourgeois media depicted it as. But to say that it was simply a collective bargaining dispute gone wrong, and it could have easily been derailed by a more rational uh, bourgeois political order, also misses much. Winnipeg 1919 showed how the logic of adversarial class relations led from the mundane to the militant. Objective conditions exacerbated the level of antagonism between irreconcilable interests and a revolutionary subjective element was present and in a position to guide the unfolding conflict. The leaders of the Winnipeg general strike were, for the most part, all radicals, all socialists. They were not necessarily the ensconced trade union leadership in the conservative craft unions. <clears throat> Objective conditions meant that this was not a revolution, but the prospect of revolutionary struggle and transformation did seem in 1919 to be possible, especially, of course, as the state and employers dug in their heels and, organs and, 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 and offered up a firm opposition. Vancouver's red flag discussed how, as general strikes unfold, they throw up the necessity of creating institutions of dual power. <coughs> Displacing the capitalist government, they said, which operates for the benefit of the bourgeoisie. Winnipeg's general strike thus proved how a fusion of the industrial struggle with an oppositional politics could threaten bourgeois power and nurture visions of socioeconomic transformation and the creation of an alternative society. It could not have happened had not class antagonisms uh, pushed the masses of workers to militant strike action. But it would not have gone as far as it did had there not been a contingent of working class leaders who saw beyond the limitations of bread and butter trade union demands to a golden future, in which, as the socialist writer Jack London expressed at the time, there would be no servants not but the service of love. For decades after 1919, the workers' defeat of that year was celebrated not as a drubbing, but as the articulation of democracy's potential. The 41-day strike, for, for instance, witnessed 171 mass meetings. 171 mass meetings, which were expressions of the kind of participatory democracy that would be heralded by 1960s youth as a new left antidote to the uh, in limitations of parliamentary elitism. Bill Pritchard, a, a strike activist and militant, noted that the strike itself had commenced democratically. The workers stood for open discussion and decision by ballot. They actually voted democratically to be in the general strike. That was how the strike was called. That was how it was carried on. It was not an autocracy, Soviet or otherwise, in spite of the caricatures uh, of the powerful who uh, resented the democratic practices uh, which were exercised from below. In the aftermath of the general strike, the politics of labor uh, turned defeat in, the, in 1919 into polling victories. The Conservative Party, led by Arthur Meehan, uh, we can go to the next one now, um, and other specials, and these, this, is, uh, this is Bloody Saturday, uh, again, a few more depictions of that. That's the famous, iconic kind of streetcar, yeah. uh, uh, where they're actually building a, a sculpture monument right, to it yeah. in Winnipeg. Yeah. There have been virtually no monuments to the general strike because of its the tenderness of the memories. Uh, and these are the strike <coughs> leaders arrested, uh, and that uh, I think keys into the, the sort of labor defense mobilizations. I think that's the last one. Uh, oh, these are the really Reverend William Bynes, who was one of the leaders of the strike, uh, arrested. Bob Russell, a poor picture, but the best I could get. Uh, Samuel Blumenberg, one of the immigrant workers, a uh, Jewish socialist uh, who was deported. And here's the prison bars cannot, con that's the labor defense mobilizations that were, the strikes called off, but it, it gives rise to a larger movement. Um, so in the aftermath of the, of the general strike, then, the politics of labor turned to, uh, um, to uh, uh, the legislature. Five of the strike leaders who were arrested in 1919 ran successfully for office in the next federal and provincial elections, which saw Meehan himself defeated in his Portage La Prairie uh, Manitoba seat. Uh, 
three of the campaigning uh, strike leaders actually ran their uh, electoral contests from jail cells. <laughs> Municipal, provincial, and federal elections in Manitoba were for decades influenced by 1919's class politics, and this was especially evident in civic elections. As late as 1969, when the New Democratic uh, Party had a provincial vi victory, 17 of the 29 elected Social Democrats came from Winnipeg constituencies, with some of those elected being descendants of general strike participants. So Winnipeg proclaimed from 1919 to our present day that there is no dishonor in struggling to win, only to lose to a powerful foe who holds many cards drawn from the stacked deck of capitalist uh, reality. The larger dishonor is a failure to fight. Defeats growing out of struggle, like Winnipeg 1919, can and do live on as great victories, as examples of stands taken on the battleground of class resistance. So I think I'll sort of end there. And there okay, thank you, Brian. Okay, Gary. Wow, what a description of the strike. That was wonderful, Brian. Um, what I want to talk about a little bit more is the uh, is what was leading up to the no, strike. Can you hold the mic? Can you hold the mic? Yeah. What's the noise? Oh, that's just... Uh, it's just ah, like the middle wall. Yeah, that's projector going. <laughs> <laughs> can you, can you, can you hold the mic? Too much. Ah, ah, ah. It's too much. All right, I'll just turn this okay. You can turn it up, maybe. I'll just. Uh, he can turn it up, maybe. No, <laughs> Do you want to share? Or no. <laughs> it's okay. You turn up the Yeah. Okay. There you go. Good. Good. Okay. So uh, I think we all really appreciated Brian's excellent description of the, of the strike. <laughs> what I want to talk about a bit more is what led up to it and the context in which the strike occurred. And also a little bit more about what the uh, the results of the strike were. <coughs> I should say at the outset that John Riddell told me last night that he heard a speech by Liz Rowley, who is the leader of the Communist Party, where he she described the strike as a as adventurism and a big defeat for the working class. And a, as, uh, and a mistake. A uh, mistake. Yeah. <coughs> we don't think that. The Winnipeg strike began on the 15th of May. Some of my material will overlap with Brian. Um, on the 15th of May and ended on the 25th of June. During that time, the strike committee set up by the unions ran the city. It was the first and so far the only worker-run city in Canada, brief though it was. For 42 days, six weeks, the workers in the city of Winnipeg ran the city, not the, po not the politicians. And a good part of that, there was nothing the politicians could do. As Brian pointed out, those things that did happen, happened with the authorization of the straight committee, and they carried signs to that effect. You can imagine how that galled the politicians and the bosses that, uh, as Brian said, the lowly, um, you know, life was upended. And, of course, the 1% really resented the fact that the uh, majority of the people were actually running the city. How could that happen? <laughs> <laughs> a year and a half earlier, on November 7th of 1917, under the leadership of the Bolsheviks, led par primarily by Lenin and Trotsky, the workers had seized power in Petrograd, um, establishing the very first worker state in history. These two events do have a relationship. Both of these events rose out of the massive imperialist convulsion of blood and gore and disease and destruction known as World War I. The four long years of mud and blood and artillery fire and machine guns and rain and cold had been a hell none of the soldiers had imagined. Repeated uncaring orders from aristocratic officers on both sides for hundreds of thousands of soldiers to go over the top and into the teeth of merciless machine gun fire and had resulted in slaughter and mountains of corpses with the maggots and rats that inevitably accompany them. These, when these workers in uniform recoiled and refused to continue such insane and, and suicidal behavior, they were summarily court-martialed and shot dead. 
This was brutal imperialist competition in its most basic and bloody form. Working class Canadians had signed up en masse in a wave of enthusiasm for flag waving and the parades and the chance to go overseas and do something exciting and heroic. Their drab lives in the forests and mines and factories and grain fields did little to hold them back. Their introduction to the reality of modern war came quickly and roughly. These young Canadians um, adapted to it and became among the toughest soldiers on the Allied side. German soldiers, or sorry, German officers would watch when Canadian troops, where Canadian troops were sent and send in re reinforcements. Partly this was because of the grit shown by these kids from the Canadian wilderness who lived in rough conditions in Canada, and partly it was the greater willingness of British officers to send in the colonials to try to reduce the long casualty lists of the dead and wounded being sent home to Britain. But at least this was a war to end all wars, the war to make the world <laughs> safe for democracy. <laughs> or at least that was the ruling class version. At the end of it all, demobilization was slow. Remember that peace came on November the 11th, and the troops were sent back to England in slow order, and then sat there for months through the British winter of rain and snow and cold. Um, they were left in camps in England, um, without, often without pay and even short of food. No longer the naive patriotic kids who volunteered. Canadian soldiers rioted repeatedly. There was talk of using Canadian troops to fight the Red Army and the Soviet Union, but it was generally felt that the soldiers would be unreliable in general for that purpose. <laughs> the mood among the men was against this. They were sick of war and wanted to go home. Many of them felt a strong solidarity and sympathy, sympathy with the new workers' government in Russia. A contingent was sent, as uh, Brian pointed out, from Canada to Vladivostok, on the east coast of the Soviet Union. They were sent through Victoria. During the march through the city to the ships, they mutinied. The mutiny was uh, quelled and they sailed with the, with the uh, mutineer leaders in irons. They got to Vladivostok but never fired a shot at the Red Army. The Red Army won against aristocratic Russian generals and their foreign allied imperialist troops. How had such a thing happened? Um, why were the workers ruling Russia? Such a thing had never happened before. The overthrow of the Tsarist regime and then the Kerensky government was precipitated by the horror of the war. <coughs> Bolsheviks, who had opposed the war from the outset, entered the army uh, to be with the, the worker and peasant soldiers and share their fate and agitate against the war. As the death toll skyrocketed, and as in the West, arrogant off aristocratic officers treated the soldiers as valueless pawns, the soldiers began to rebel. The soldiers were, the Bolsheviks were informing them of the uprisings in Petrograd and elsewhere. The workers began simply to shoot their officers and head back home. Prescription well worth looking for in the future. <laughs> At home they overwhelmingly supported the workers and the revolution. This was the revolution the imperialists, including the Canada, Canada's ruling class, feared and loathed. They saw Bolshevism in every worker's action, in every worker's meeting, in every whisper of unionism. Many workers, after the profound and sobering experience of the war, were far less naive as the war came ground to an end. Their leaders knew about the revolution, and many supported it. There was no Communist Party in Canada in 1919, it would be formed in 1921 in a barn in Guelph, Ontario. But there were, there were class conscious leaders, socialists, anarchists, syndicalists, many of whom would later become members of the early Communist Party. Labor conferences in Canada in the period overwhelmingly expressed solidarity with the new Soviet Union and passed resolutions demanding the Canadian soldiers be brought home from Vladivostok. After the revolution in Russia, there were some 30 workers' rebellions occurred uh, across Europe and Asia. These included the Winnipeg strike and the related sympathy strikes across Canada. There was a vast worldwide unrest following the war and inspired by the revolution. Settlers, sorry, soldiers returned home, 
desiring jobs and a normal life um, lifestyle again, only to find factories shutting down because of the war was over, um, and the, the roaring of the factories and the great war profits uh, were ending, and therefore the workers could simply be laid off. Soaring unemployment, rate, uh, unemployment rates, increasing bankruptcies and immigrants um, taking over jobs from veterans, which the bosses used effectively to, and some labor leaders used effectively to um, divide the working class. The cost of living was raised due to inflation caused by World War I, making life even harder than before the war. Another factor which caused the strike were the working conditions in many of the factories, which were deplorable and we would not even imagine today uh, what the kind of conditions that the workers at that time faced. After three months of unproductive negotiations between the workers of Winnipeg, the employers of the Winnipeg Builders Exchange and the union um, worker frustration grew, the city council's new proposal to the workers was unsatisfactory to the four departments, electrical workers took action, and a strike was established. Waterworks and fire department employees joined. The strikers, as, um, as Brian was saying, were labeled as Bolsheviks who were attempting to undermine Canada. The city council viewed the strike as utterly unacceptable and thus dismissed striking workers. A turning point, and one that should always be spotted by socialist workers, is that such firings did not discourage the workers. Instead, other civic unions joined the strike out of sympathy, which was an important feature of 20th century history. So when actions, even mass firings, only fire up the strike, you've got a different animal at play, a different, different situation. On May 13th, City Council gathered again to review and look over the proposed agreement <clears throat> Once again, the city council did not accept the proposals of the workers without their own amendments, specifically the Fowler Amendment, which would submit all issues or negotiations in the future to binding arbitration. In other words, eliminating in future the right to strike. The, this amendment incensed civic employees, and by, and by Friday, May 24th, an estimated 6,800 strikers from 13 trades had joined the strike. Restrictive labor policy in the 1900s meant that there was only two ways for a union to be recognized. It could be recognized voluntarily by an employer, or it could be won in, in strike. There was, no, um, there was no collective bargaining legislation, a process that you could force uh, the acceptance of a union. In any case, what happened in Winnipeg was that all the, uh, the vast majority of the unionized workers went out and the strike only grew to 35,000 by virtue of the fact that un large numbers of unorganized workers went out in sympathy. General st uh, strikes broke out in other cities in protest, and Brian has mentioned this. There were 13 of them. Um, what was the number you used on how many? 110,000. Population. Well, the, there were 35,000 workers on strike, and I would just take a, a, oh, as yeah, a yeah. surrogate four for a family, which is probably underestimating yeah. it. That would take you to 140,000 uh, yeah. people out of a total population of 175,000. Yeah. Wow. Wow. So, so that's the, it, 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 this has never really happened in Canada before. No, no this is a city is on strike, quite yeah. truthfully. New York Times front page to, to proclaimed Bolshevism invades Canada. The Winnipeg Free Press called the strikers bohunks, aliens, anarchists, and ran cartoons depicting radicals fire, uh, throwing bombs. However, the majority of strikers were not revolutionary. The Winnipeg strike and the huge sympathy strikes could not have ended up in a workers' Canada. There was no centralized leadership like the Bolsheviks in Russia, which could tackle the problem of state power. And state power, of course, was was brought to bear over time um, in sufficient uh, force to defeat the strike, at least to defeat the immediate strike. There were a lot of gains out of this strike. 
Most opposed to the strike were, were, was the state. I mean, the state is the conscious, you know, it's the, it, it's, the, it's the instrument of force. It's the instrument with the army and the police and, and um, the, the, um, the, uh, yeah, the instruments of force. At a local level, some politicians actually showed sympathy for the strikers, making them neither a monolith nor uh, unalterably an enemy. The federal government's only direct interest in the strike, other than um, calls from local authorities, was keeping the railroads running and the post office running. So that was their direct interest, but they became very infected by Andrews and the uh, Committee of 1000, who were whispering into their ear or yelling into their ear that, uh, that uh, this was a grave danger to political authority, capitalist political authority in Canada. I'm just skipping some bits here that have already been covered by, by Brian. Um, the committee, uh, the Andrews committee falsely declared that the strike was a violent revolutionary conspiracy by a small, small group of foreigners, which, as we've heard several times before, they referred to as alien scum. On uh, June the 9th, at behest of the committee, the City of Winnipeg Police Commission dismissed almost the entire police force and brought in thugs, basically, uh, called specials. As the situation spiraled out of control, the City of Winnipeg appealed for federal help and received extra reinforcements of Royal North Northwest Mounted Police. The strike, despite these drastic measures, control of the street streets was beyond the capacity of the city in the period between Tuesday, June the 9th, and ultimately Bloody Saturday, June the 21st. So I won't go through the meetings with the politicians, federal politicians that Brian has already described, or Bloody Saturday, which has already been described, and go to the aftermath and the results, the lessons. Eight of the strike leaders arrested on June the 18th were eventually brought to trial in what were called state trials for political crimes. Five were found guilty of the charges laid against them. Their jail sentences, as Brian has explained, were six months to two years. The jury acquitted strike leader Fred Dixon. The movement dropped charges of seditious libel. The government dropped charges of seditious libel against J.S. Wood Woodsworth, whose crime was quoting uh, in the strike bulletin from the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> Woodsworth was elected an MP in the next federal election as a labor MP and went on to be one of the founders and leaders of the Cooperative Commonwealth Federation, the forerunner of the New Democratic Party. Fearing the strike would spread to other cities, the federal government ordered Senator uh, Gideon Decker Robertson to mediate the dispute. After hearing both sides, Robertson settled in favor of the strikers and encouraged council to accept the civic employees' proposals. Bolstered by their success, the labor unions would use the strike weapon again and again to gain other labor and uh, union reforms. The Royal Commission, which investigated the strike, concluded the strike was not a, con a, con a criminal conspiracy by foreigners and suggested, quote, that if capital does not provide an, uh, enough to assure labor a contented existence, then the government might find it necessary to step in and let the state do these things at the expense of capital. So it was a, it was a head knocking on some of the most rabid uh, exploiters and would of course never come to pass. But um, organized labor thereafter was hostile to the conservatives, particularly Meehan and Robertson. And as we heard again from Brian, uh, Meehan was defeated and uh, there were no conservatives elected west of Ontario, um, at least across the prairies, and uh, there were a number of labor leaders elected to parliament. The succeeding liberal government, fearing the growing support for hard left elements, merged, uh, sorry, pledged to enact labor reforms proposed by the commission. The strike leaders who had, a, who had at least faced charges if not served time in prison such as Woodsworth mentioned above, were applauded as labor's champions, and many were elected. What are the lasting lessons of the Winnipeg General Strike? How am I doing on time? Let's see. You have uh, eight minutes. Okay. 
First, it was a based, the, the strike was based on strong solidarity among the unions and the unorganized, and the willingness of leaders of various unions to subordinate their differences in the interest of solidarity and the needs of the workers as a whole. We could use a lot more of that today. Witness the destructive withdrawal of UNIFOR from the Canadian Labour Congress, which has nothing to do with the workers' needs and everything to do with the interests and egos of the trade union bureaucrats. Secondly, it demonstrated that the workers would set up, that the workers could set up a leadership, allocate and carry out responsibilities and ensure peace, security, the distribution of food, operation of basic services, and even opening of cinemas under the authority of the strike committee. It was possible over six full weeks to run the city without the bosses and their politicians. <laughs> this is, you know, you, you start off, you don't know what's going to happen. You, you start a strike, it balloons, and suddenly nothing is working, but people need services. And so the strike leadership, the, the strike committee, has to set up initial elements of dual power. This is what terrified the and and uh, and um, the, the fear and loathing of the capitalists was really about uh, brought to a height by that. Thirdly, although brutally suppressed, this massive and impressive action brought the bosses to concede greater union rights, better pay, shorter hours in many cases, and women's suffrage shortly after was influenced by the rise of labor. Fourthly, it showed the possibility of Canada-wide action by workers as demonstrated by the size and number of sympathy strikes from Halifax to Victoria. Finally, it was a strike not only for wages and working conditions, but for rights. It was not merely economic, but to some extent political in scope, and contributed to the subsequent establish of workers-based parties such as the early Communist Party in 1921 in Ontario and in Calgary in 1932, the Cooperative Commonwealth Federation. Currently, the unions in Canada, like the NDP, I don't mean the NDP as a union, I mean in addition to the NDP, um, are dominated by a comfortable middle-class bureaucracy worried more about their high-paid jobs and perquisites than the neoliberal assault on wages and working conditions and the rights of workers. This bureaucracy hasn't faced up to the advent, there's a lot of talk about it, but they really haven't faced up to the gig economy and the pre of precarious unemployment, accelerating automation, or the fall folly of fighting to preserve planet-killing industries such as oil and gas and uh, the two-car family, the two cars per family way of living. The capital estate was the enemy in Winnipeg, and it remains so today. The same state arise, uh, st sorry, strives to impose its will and to exploit workers in other countries. I'm talking about the Canadian state, in Mexico, Cuba, Venezuela, and throughout the colonial world. The capitalist state is our enemy, not the impoverished workers in other countries. It is the task of revolutionary socialists and class-conscious workers to organize caucuses like the Workers' Action Movement to mount a fight against the right-wing, pro-capitalist union bureaucracy. We must mount demands for union democracy and a class struggle and internationalist perspective. Good union negotiators are very useful, and you shouldn't under underestimate how much a good negotiator can do. But their only real power is the mobilized mass of workers. That's where their power comes from. We need to fight for an alliance of all labor and NAFTA, for example, against the bosses of, of against all the bosses and their governments in NAFTA. I'm not sure why this hasn't, the idea hasn't been raised, or if it has, why, it, why not much has been done about it. But to me, it has from the beginning, way back when NAFTA was originally organized, seemed that Mexican labor and American <coughs> labor and Canadian labor should be lined up against these, these things and against the bosses of all of them. <laughs> the job is to utter, utterly replace the complacent, well, paid class collaborators now running the unions. We um, need a union leadership with the fighting spirit of the Winnipeg general strike and the knowledge of Marx and Lenin.
Okay, without further ado, Ryan. Well, uh, good afternoon, uh, sisters and brothers. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to come out and say a few words. Uh, tough acts to follow, both uh, Gary and Brian. Um, for, uh, let's give it up to them for, for basically um, the better understanding of the, the Winnipeg strike and, and the after effects. And uh, thank you, uh, Gary, for pointing out what union leaders are up to. <laughs> 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 but anyways, um, but I do want to pick up on some of the themes both uh, that Gary and, and Brian um, brought to the fore. And, and that is, what are like, the lasting impacts of uh, actions, whether they be general strikes or whether they be uh, one-day strikes or whether it be um, days of action like we had here in Ontario a number of years ago. Um, there is tremendous similarities between the Winnipeg strike and another strike that I'm pretty familiar with uh, long before my time, of course, um, that was led in Dublin by uh, a union leader named Jim Larkin. And in 1911, Jim Larkin uh, led out 20,000 um, impoverished workers, uh, laborers, basically, that lived in tenement housing around the docks in, uh, in Dublin. And uh, they were, um, uh, the housing was like rat infested. Um, There's the worst social housing in all of Europe. They had the highest infant mortality rate in all of Europe. Uh, people buy, die, kids dying of tuberculosis, scarlet fever, you name it. Um, there was, it was horrible conditions. Jim Larkin led them out onto the streets and very much like as in Winnipeg, the employers came together, at that time about 100 employers, who uh, essentially employed most of the workforce in Dublin. Um, the demands of the strike essentially were better wages but also the right to join the union. And um, they effectively kept them out for six months and, and starved them into submission. Uh, and they went back and at that time people were saying that the strike was a failure. Um, but it was only a couple of years later um, that one of Larkin's union organizers, a guy by the name of James Connolly, uh, was part and parcel of the revolution and the Irish rebellion in 1916 um, that sparked rebellions all around the world and led to Irish independence. Um, so clearly you can see when you take these types of actions um, that it does have a kick-on effect uh, down the road and, uh, and folks, I say, like leaders like James Connolly come to the fore and, and lead revolutions. Uh, which changed the course of history in many ways and many people would say the course of history around the world because not long after Ireland um, gained its independence, uh, India gained its independence and there was a breakup of the, of the British Empire um, and a lot of that was sparked on the, on the streets of Dublin by a guy named uh, James Connolly and of course Jim Larkin. Um, in the Winnipeg strike, uh, part and parcel of the uh, knock-on effect of it, of course, was covered by both Brian and Gary, was the formation of the CCF, which is the forerunner to the NDP. So clearly, they elected some leaders out of that strike who went into Parliament and began to represent the interests of the working class in Parliament, which hadn't really happened before. So that was a, a huge benefit. But we also, a number of years later, because of the agitation and because of the additional strikes across the country, we ended up getting some labour laws. Um, you know, the right to strike, the, the right to the collective bargaining, um, the right to, uh, to join the union, uh, the right to refuse unsafe work came a number of years later. Um, but that gave us, you know, a, the jurisprudence, if you will, of labor laws. Now, that in itself has a little bit of a downside to it because, um, as been referred to by, by Gary in particular, um, when we talk about today's union leaders, um, we've fallen into the trap in some cases of having business union leaders um, versus social movement union uh, leaders. And the business union leaders tend to rely upon the courts and rely upon political parties uh, to conduct their political action or to, rather than getting into um, long strikes or illegal strikes or walkouts or whatever the case may be, they rely upon the courts to settle their disputes. And of course, we don't control the courts. The courts are really essentially there for the bosses. Um, so the, the, it's the bosses, uh, um, you know, jurisdiction that's 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 ruling over uh, the decisions that workers should actually be making themselves uh, by walking off the job. I do recall that uh, back in 1985, 
Um, I uh, organised a, uh, an illegal strike, a walkout of the uh, nuclear power plant. Uh, it's in the book, actually, I'm going to read the story about it. But out of that came a, uh, came a settlement. Uh, like sued for $10 million, of course, along the way, uh, which, which the employer had to drop as a consequence of the, uh, of the workers basically saying, we're not going back to work unless you drop the, uh, the charges against Ryan and unless he, he has his job secured. Um, but, you, you know, when you can take collective action, you can see what, what, what flows from it. Now, the days of action, some people will argue, when we went against Mike Harris, when he was attacking people on welfare, when he was slashing uh, social services, and we began to organize days of actions. Well, just like in the Winnipeg strike, just the forerunner to the days of action were the childcare workers, women in this province. And when Harris got elected in, in June, in August or September of that year, we organized a 5,000 uh, childcare worker walkout from across the province, convened on Queen's Park, and uh, because Harris was going to be taking away wage subsidies from childcare workers, which are some of the lowest paid workers uh, in, the social, in, the, uh, in social services, um, 5,000 of those uh, women with their children uh, made it into Queen's Park, and before they put the barriers up, uh, as they have today, there were no barriers back in 1980, uh, back in 1995. It began to rain, so all the 5,000 women with their children went into the halls of, of uh, Queen's Park and they sat on the stairs, and the cops didn't know what to do because they couldn't go pulling women off the, off the stairwells with children in their arms and so on, right? Um, but Harris backed down from that, particular, uh, from that particular walkout and actually reinstated the, the, wa the wage uh, increases for the, for the child care workers. Harris later on, just before we did the Days of Action, he decided he was going to take away the right to, to strike during the amalgamations of all of our cities. You probably remember that. He was amalgamating hospitals, schools, and cities. Uh, and during the course of that, he said to the public sector, we will not allow you to go on strike during these amalgamations because they were trying to give the power to the employers to open up our collective agreements and take out uh, all the benefits that they've been looking for for years and years and years. So what we had to do was go across Ontario and start holding strike votes of QP members, basically, uh, in each of the cities across the province. And the whole objective was, we knew that there would be backbenchers uh, in those cities. And you can travel outside of Ontario, you can get media like that. It's like shooting fish in a barrel. You go up to North Bay and you start having a strike vote of 10,000 public sector workers. And we took the vote there that night and we had like 85% strike mandates on average right across the province. Um, I'm sitting on a plane coming back from, from Thunder Bay and there's a Tory MP sitting in front of me reading the newspaper and across the newspaper was QP uh, uh, votes to strike at 85%. Now we know he's going back in to tell Harris, to say, Jesus Christ, what's going on out there? Um, QP's taking these strike votes all over the place. So basically we were putting it to Harris to say, unless you pull that legislation, uh, Bill 136, there's going to be a province-wide strike in this province. Uh, and we had all the backbenchers in all the different cities all carrying in the same story. Harris called us into a meeting and he said, okay, I'm prepared uh, to withdraw that piece of legislation around the, the, uh, the right to strike, providing you, know, you guys are not going to use it previously, have strikes all over the place. Uh, he said, we're not making any guarantees. We just want the right to strike to be reinstated back in our collective agreements. Um, and he did. The Globe and Mail, the, the, the boss's newspaper, the next day had a big banner headline, Harris blinks. <laughs> but he only blinked because we were prepared to take strikes, we were prepared to take actions. Uh, and this yeah. is the, the uh, come to today, if I could, because now I've only got 15 minutes. But the problem we have today, and Gary is so right, um, you know, it's, the, it's about leadership and it's about the courage to be able to, to walk off the job or to mobilize the base. Yes. You know, I'm just pissed off to no end that the, the, the Labour movement, Ontario Federation of Labour, calls together 850 local union leaders on the 25th of March. Some of you probably attended that meeting. And out of it, they basically said, we're not yet ready to call any sort of a job action. Yeah. Now, when are you ever ready? When did we ever sit down in our workplaces and say, oh, we're ready to go on strike or we're ready to, to mobilize? It takes somebody that's willing to walk off the job, just like the, the women did were the first ones, by the way, as Brian pointed out, who walk off the job in Winnipeg. Um, it was the telephone receptionists, basically, uh, as they say, euphemistically refer to them as the hello girls. They're the first one that walked off the job. And it always does take somebody to stand up and somebody to take the risk and say, okay, we're going to do it. Uh, everybody feels like we want to do it, but nobody ever really takes the opportunity. Now, we did it in London with the Days of Action. We decided we were going to shut down a city 
um, just to see how we, the kind of a response we would get. This was back in 1996. Um, so we decided that we got 12,000 people came out in London. It was bitter cold, it was about minus 30 degrees. 12,000 people actually walked off the job in the city of London. Wow. And we thought, okay, we've got something going here. About a month later, we decided we'd go into London. We had 100,000 people come out into the city of London because the school teacher, teachers, they joined the strikes with us, the walkouts. One thing I will say about this, if you can get the school teachers anywhere in, in North America and they've proven it down in the United States that you can actually take on City Hall or take on the, the government of the day uh, if te the teachers decide to walk out. The teachers joined the strikes back in, in 1995. We ended up in the city of Toronto with 250,000 people on the streets. Shut down the city of Toronto. Um, it was a sight to see, you know, the helicopters flying over top on the news that night and you could see the Don Valley Parkway was completely empty. The 401 was completely empty. The city was basically shut down, but barred the strikers that were walking around Bay Street and elsewhere. But when the teachers got their act together and worked with the rest of the labor movement, um, we can move mountains. And I'm saying this time around, I think it's going to take the school teachers again, but this time it was the students that walked off the job first off. The students walked out of the classrooms. Yeah. You know, the 15 and 16 and 17 year olds had the guts and the courage to basically say, we're going to work with the teachers and if you're going to start cutting back on class sizes and cutting back on teachers' wages or laying off teachers in the system, we're going to walk out. And they did. But we didn't get the school teachers to follow up and reciprocate. Had, we, had they have done that, uh, and I do believe we need one more other big union um, working with the school teachers uh, to spark the kinds of days of action. I don't think we have necessarily have to have the same kind of actions that we had back in 1995. It could be different. Uh, I would actually suggest you don't shut them down just for one day. You should shut them down for three or four days at a time and keep up and rotate the various cities. But the point I'm trying to make is, is that it really is um, about the, somebody having the courage and, and the leadership to basically take it on. Now, I will argue, I don't see anywhere right now today, I don't see the leadership of the labor movement uh, being capable at this moment in time of calling these kinds of actions that are needed. But I do look around and I see organizations like the Workers' Action Center, who actually went out and mobilized this province uh, for non-unionized workers in their campaign for $15 an hour. That was social movement unionism at its best. They worked with communities, they brought in young immigrant workers, they brought in refugees, they brought in uh, just young workers coming out of university, real educated workers who can't find a decent job. They mobilized all of those folks and they worked a little bit with the labor movement. But I did a study, you can take a look in my book, I took a, not a study, but I took a look at the Workers' Action Center, their budget. So in the height of their campaign in 2017, they had about $850,000 was their annual budget for, for the mobilization across the province. Guess how much the labor movement contributed to that $850,000? 5%. is all they contributed. So you can see that the labor movement and Houston are not getting it. They're not getting it when you see uh, community organizations, you know, desperate looking for help. We, we are at the, when I was at the OFL, we put together what we call a common front. We had built an organization with 90 community organizations working with the labor movement. But we needed some money, seed money, to be able to give to those community organizations to, so they could come to the meetings, whether it be in Toronto or wherever else they were. We needed to hire some staff to be able to service um, these community organizations and give them some sort of a structure in place. And we have unions like OPSU who pull their money out of the, out of the OFL, Shame. depriving Shame. us of the ability to be able to give some seed money to the community organizations. And just like Gary indicated a few moments ago, I'm so pissed off with Unifor for pulling their money and pulling their membership out of the CLC and out of the OFL. I mean, that's just the antithesis of trade unionism. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that is the opposite of what we should be trying to be doing. Working together to try to pull all of the labor movement together in one force, but working with the community. Like, labor on its own will never be able um, to have the effect that we need to have on society. We've got to go out and absolutely work with the communities. You know, and we've got to then feed those communities. We've got to give them seed money, give them the ability to organize themselves. And then we have our common front and we can take on anybody, because I don't believe that community and the labor movement, that there's anybody can stop uh, us from achieving our goals in this province if we can get those two, two elements of society working together the way we should be. Um, 
Unfortunately, it's not going to happen. So therefore, it's going to fall. So I say the Workers' Action Center. But what about this organization as well? Um, you know, it's good for us to be out there criticizing the labor movement or criticizing anybody else. But we too then have got to start to say, okay, then who do we have influence with? And I mean, I don't know all of the folks in this room, but I'm positive you've all got connections with different organizations, with factions within the university sector, within the education sector, um, and, and, you know, civil society at large. So we need to start to pull those folks into these meetings and into uh, broader coalitions like the Common Front and, and see if, in fact, uh, we can get something going. Because if we're waiting for the union leaders to get their act together, we're going to be left waiting for a long time. Mm -hmm. So anyway, so the, the Winnipeg strike, um, the days of actions, any form of action at all, whether it be a legal strike or an illegal, an illegal strike, to me at least anyway, that's the genesis of, of, of where or the, the spark that could create this common front that we need to take on forward. And, and here's where I'm going to finish on this note. Here's what I think is going to happen. I think Ford has been emboldened by looking out there and he's gone after school teachers and we haven't seen any response. He's gone after uh, autistic children and we haven't seen any response. He's gone after children's aid societies. For the name of God, who goes after children's aid societies and puts the funding to children's aid societies? But there's been no response. He's gone after the healthcare sector and there's been no response. And I can tell you what's going to happen. He's going to come after the RAND formula because he's going to say there's no fight left in the labor movement in Ontario. He's going to introduce right to work legislation and he's going to get away with it because there's going to be no fight in the labor movement. And unless we actually get our act together, we are going to be one hell of a mess in this province trying to recover and to recoup things like the RAND formula. Because if they ever go and disappear, then we will never ever recover them. And, and believe me, if you say to union members in Ontario, you can have the same benefits, you can have the same collective agreement, but you don't have to pay any union dues. Guess how many of them is going to opt not to pay union dues? So we know what's going to happen. It's going to be the demise of the labor movement unless they get their shit together and start fighting this government and doing it in a serious way by putting people onto the streets by the hundreds of thousands and show this guy forward. Now that he's down in the polls, show him that there is some fight left in this labor movement and we're going to take him on. So sisters and brothers, join that fight. Help us to get out there and mobilize and give some strength in the backbone of some of these union leaders to go out and start the mobilization that's going to push this guy forward out of office in a couple of years' time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Steve. Okay, the floor is open. The same format. Uh, we will take uh, uh, some questions before we come back to the panel, and then uh, and you all have uh, up to three minutes. Okay. So I saw some ends. Yes. Okay, you're on, brother. I'm probably loud enough. I'm a teacher as well, so I probably don't stand need a mic. Up. Stand up, but I'll stand up. Okay. Uh, I've been sitting here, and I. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. The mic isn't about how loud you are. It's about how loud okay. you can hear. Okay. Okay. <laughs> That's fine. You forget that people need to hear. There's a certain demographic. Right. You're right. Okay. okay. Sorry about that. Uh, yeah, I'm just afraid my voice is too loud. The. Um, <laughs> Okay. okay. Is this good? Let's move on. Okay. So, uh, yeah, I just wanted to make a few comments, and I hope that through this there will be some questions that can be answered. I'm not sure if I'm going to formulate a question as such, but I would like to have a response. Uh, I uh, was recently elected president of the New Westminster and District Labor Council, and I think that we have a few problems within the labor movement. One of the things being that labor movements are dependent on labor. Uh, personally, I don't want to see right to work legislation. I want to see right to not work. Uh, we have a, an economic system that is still providing goods and services. Uh, it's being automated. Um, one of the things that we're referred to as globalization. Uh, as a movement, um, we did not get ahead of the global globalization. Uh, we didn't get ahead on NAFTA so that we did have so that we could have fair uh, working uh, legislation in uh, workers' legislation in all of our countries. Uh, so we were exploited because of that. Um, one of the troubles that the union, or I should say the labor movement has, is that as they are negotiating, they're negotiating within the capitalist system. They are dependent on their jobs for their money. 
And this is something that we have to change because that is in the service of capitalism. Um, so, we, so as they are defending their work, they're actually defending capitalism. And this is a bit of a contradiction. So we really do have to see this as a class war. This is not about labor um, as such. In fact, with the wealth that we have, with the automation that's taking place, I'll, I'll also say about uh, the longshore workers in um, BC uh, just were locked out a couple of days ago. And one of the things that they want, they're automating the services that they're providing, okay? And what they want to make sure is that they don't lose jobs. Um, this is a very valid point that labor is raising. Uh, but they will not, uh, management will not put that in the collective agreement, so this is a problem. Uh, I was also going to say about CLC, I was at the, um, I, I was at the winter school uh, in, uh, um, out, out in uh, BC, and I took the uh, modern ways of contacting your, um, your membership. And uh, one of the problems there, and something that I agree with the panel in, we have to have people on the street. It's not going to work in Twitter. 30 seconds. Okay. It's not going to work in Twitter. Uh, you know, you can have, you can have 100,000 tweets, you can have a million tweets, but if you have 100,000 people or a million people on the streets, that's whenever you're going to get things done. Uh, I also wanted to make a brief comment when Gary said about working conditions. Uh, globalization is allowing for the same kind of working conditions that existed in Winnipeg in, in 1919 in the rest of the world. So we have to address that as well. Thank you. Okay, well, I see the sister at the back row. Thank you. And I'd like to thank the panel for an interesting, you know, presentation. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, I'm Marianne, and I'm a retired Bell Canada worker. And I was involved in the 1972 general strike. And I was also involved in the 1980 lockout. That was our punishment for uh, amalgamating a legitimate union into Bell Canada. They locked us out for 10 weeks. That wasn't a strike. And now what they're doing is taking the monies that they get from the government. Bell gets a hell of a lot of money in benefits from the, the federal and the provincial governments. And the deferred taxes, and they're taking Canadian jobs and shipping them overseas. Okay. And that's what they're doing to break the unions here. So when, like, you talked about... Uh, um, standing up to big business, what do you suggest we do about stuff like that? Or is there anything we can do? Thank you. Okay. Uh, Julius. Great. Thank you. Uh, thanks to the panelists. Great uh, presentations. I was uh, in Winnipeg a few weeks ago for the uh, centenary celebration. It was a conference, and uh, it was really interesting, very informative. But I, I think the three of you should have had a panel there because yeah. you, you injected a certain energy, uh, which I think was some well, it was certainly missing from the presentations that were given um, in uh, in Winnipeg, particularly uh, when you make reference, um, a critical reference to today's leadership. Um, I was on the executive board of, of OPSU for two years. Prior to that, as, as Sid knows, I was uh, part of a campaign to get us back into the OFL paying our dues. Uh, when I ran recently, I reminded the folks in my region of the mistake that we made and that essentially the demobilized uh, labor movement today is partially as a result of OPSU's actions of, of crippling uh, the OFL. And uh, it, it's still in rough shape. They, they had to sell uh, 15 Gervais Drive, which was a building that the OFL owned. And uh, it set a horrible precedent. Um, and today, OPSU is, is somewhat, the leadership of OPSU, at least uh, the majority are, it's cozying up to Unifor, which is a raiding union. Um, they, are, they have a commonality, and this is, this is a big problem. While OPSU is not a raid, I would say is not a raiding union, 
both have uh, withdrawn their dues payments or participation in the House of Labor for their own opportunistic um, bureaucratic reasons, which has been at the detriment of uh, workers. But I want to talk about bargaining. Uh, I want to talk about free collective bargaining and the importance of free collective bargaining and mobilizing the membership. And I work for the Ontario Public Service, which is a large, it's the largest section of the Ontario Public Service Employees Union. And I have to say that when, uh, when labor leadership uh, negotiates contracts behind the backs of workers, it has an absolutely horrible uh, effect. 30 seconds. Uh, and this is a major, major problem because essentially what happens is the workers go to sleep. Say, you know, as an American, I've learned a lot about Canadian politics in you know, the past, uh, past few days I've been here. And uh, you know, I've learned a lot from you know, this conference, but also from uh, discussions with Julius. And I'm struck that though, you know, the political system is different, you know, we don't have a Labour Party, we, we don't have a lot of, a lot of things you guys have here, that the, uh, the Labour leaders, the Labour misleaders of both our countries they must have learned from the same school. Because <laughs> what, what I can hear is some of these uh, criticisms about the uh, um, labor leaders here. I'm just amazed by how, how similar it is to, to ours. Although I, perhaps ours might be a little bit worse because uh, you know we uh, had 400,000 federal workers not getting paid for a few weeks during government uh, shutdown and no one went on strike. Although there were threats. Uh, we also have labor leaders that are you know shaking the hands with Trump constantly and you know on the news that way. Shame. And um, you know, I was just thinking in terms of like uniform, and you know, as a Unite Here member and a hotel worker, yeah, I know a little bit about uniform. But um, you know, them leaving the House of Labor just kind of reminds me of when the AFL CIO was having their old um, you know get up and change to win left. And it's all you know, all these kind of personal politics. It's not really any anyone putting forward a necessary program that labor leaders in our countries need to put forward. And um, you know, I, I want to say specifically to a comrade teacher over there, uh, about automation. I, I don't know how it is here, but in the U.S., uh, and perhaps this is anecdotal, but so many people have so many jobs, too many jobs, and it, so much so that the Marriott strikes last year, they took up a slogan, one job should be enough, and that's been taken up by so many American workers. So the same thing. So I wanted to be a uh, foregone conclusion, I have a question of automation, um, because so many of us are working so many jobs, and I wanted to talk too about like globalization, the, the answer uh, to the crisis of that is of course internationalism, uh, is of course talking to our brothers and sisters in other countries throughout Latin America, throughout Europe, throughout Asia, throughout everywhere. Um, let's see here, and in terms of the... the 30 you know, seconds. Yeah, in terms of a question of uh, organizing and organizing, like Christian brought up, I mean, I think um, unions play, have, a, have a specific role in helping to do that. I mean, in America, unions represent 15 million workers in some of the most strategic industries. In, in my industry, in New York City, 35,000 hotel workers are unionized. If they put forward a, a plan in the, in the union, in Local 6 of Unite Here, that you know, they're going to go on strike until there's a master agreement for all restaurant workers, hotel workers, all the the small shops in New York City, they could win it. And I think the larger trade uh, unions, the larger federations have to do similarly. But at the same time, the teachers who went on strike in my country, many of them were not unionized. Many of them just uh, followed the, the, many of them just went on strike in North Virginia and Arizona, places not well known for their unions, which leads to the other thing. Right to work has been in my country for a long time, and it has not led to a demise of unions. It just forces the left in the unions to organize better, to organize more. Thank you. Okay, Bob Lyons. Okay, one of... Is it on? Okay. Just p briefly two points. Uh, I want to, to deal with the question of the labor leadership. <clears throat> okay, deal with the question of the labor leadership. And to connect A.J. Mosier and Jerry Diaz. Uh, when Brian made his description of the labor leadership of who was who in the Winnipeg General Strike. On the one side, you had revolutionary socialists and Dyrnikists and uh, people ready to struggle on behalf and on behalf of mobilize the working class. On the other hand, you had A.J. Mosher and his coterie of what we know as business unionists, but who sociologically, sociologically and historically, are agents of imperialism within the working class. And this is not a 
a pejorative term. These are this is the actual function based on the functions that be, people perform within the trade union movement. They are bought and paid for by the boss. As a former business manager for an international union, I do go to the same schools, by the way, as those in the United States. And the, my international president, when I became a business manager, uh, who was no longer the international president, but actually went to jail, right? His, his favorite hobby was collecting rare Ferraris. Now this is a leader of the laborers union, people who dig ditches, people who do the lowest form of construction work, and this guy collected fer uh, Ferraris and was actually jailed because he didn't pay taxes in uh, Rhode Island where he was supposed to afford a Ferrari F50. Jerry Diaz, these type of people, right, are not trade union leaders. They are agents of the imperialists, and they're paid for by, bought and paid for by those people. They are part of the enemy, and for working people, they are the same, have the same weight as, in fact, as the bourgeoisie does, because the, the bourgeoisie operates through these people within the trade union movement, and they have to be removed. Secondly, in answer to Christian, how do you deal with questions like automation, the threat of shutdowns and stuff? Well, if you look at places like Zanon in, in Argentina, which is a ceramic factory, when the boss shut down the factory, the workers took it over. They didn't wait for, call, they didn't call for nationalization. They took it over. The same way that there was a sit-down strike at Oshawa, if there were a labor leadership worth its salt, within and with outside, those workers would still be there. GM would be nationalized through the actions of the workers. The workers would take it over and would involve the community on how are we going to transition from an agent of General Motors to one which helps Canadian workers in our communities. Thank you, Bob. Thank you. Okay, all the way over here to Comrade Seth. Thank you. Hi, my name is uh, Seth Baker, um, and I, uh, well first I want to kind of touch on the value of strikes, because strikes are a very valuable tool um, of class struggle for the working class. Not only because they lead to a lot of important reforms and gains, uh, but also because they are important for the working class forming itself as a class that is capable of um, organizing itself and self-governance. Um, and our goal is not merely piecemeal reforms, but actually taking power as a class. So this is an incredibly powerful tool for the working class, um, and the unions are the organs of the working class. Um, and I, uh, I recently wrote an article for Cosmonaut Magazine about the Winnipeg General Strike where I talked about this. Um, you can find it at cosmonaut.blog. Um, and so when we talk about, um, you know, our goal is not merely piecemeal reforms, but taking power. This means that not only do we need the working class to form itself as a class, but we need a political leadership to actually form around a revolutionary program that leads inexorably to revolution and taking over the state. So this requires a merger of socialist theory into the revolutionary socialist leaders <coughs> with the workers' movement and the formation of a mass revolutionary workers' party. And this was the failure of the revolutionary left in 1919 in Canada, was that they failed to, they, they didn't have a strategy for forming a mass party. They existed, they were incredibly militant, but they didn't have a clear program and vision that led to the formation of a mass party and taking over the state. Um, and so the role of the mass party is to form a counter hegemony or a counter sovereignty against the bourgeois state uh, to form, you know, to, to train the working class in self-governance. Um, and one of the ways we do this, um, Hal Draper in Anatomy of the Microsect talks about forming a loyal opposition to trade unionism. And what this means is leading, that revolutionary socialists need to lead the struggle within the labor seconds. movement against the bureaucrats, because the bureaucrats are opposed to the goals of workers. And this means not only forming an opposition and leading the struggle against the bureaucrats and the unions, but also in the NDP, the Labour Party. 
Um, so if you'd like to address that, feel free. But thank okay. you. Right behind, uh, right behind Seth, the comrade from Montreal. Good afternoon. Um, earlier, uh, a few minutes ago, there was a question of how unique it is, maybe among people in this room, to be part of a workplace that is not organized. I don't consider it to be unique at all. I've held probably more than 10 jobs in six years, and not a single one of them was organized. Most of them took place in the restaurant industry. Now I work in video games. That's going to last the summer. Um, our co uh, comrade from Left Voice uh, spoke about the Mario strikes and the hopes for some uh, future actions to be um, re perhaps representative for the struggles for restaurant workers. And that is very hopeful to me because um, it's pro I think uh, restaurant workers, especially those in the kitchen, uh, not so much the waiters, sorry, um, uh, are the ones that are probably getting, well, reamed harder than any kind of working position I've ever seen. Um, now, there's a practical uh, issue with trying to form, say, uh, a union within a restaurant, such as uh, the earlier concerns brought up about globalization, and uh, in the restaurant specifically, <laughs> well, how do you form a union when your work, workplace is 12 people? Um, I've never really figured that out. I was always curious. And in the matter of video games, my position is on call. I'm called a quality assurance tester. We test for bugs. And uh, because we're all on call employees of, say, maybe 100 employees for 50 shifts, uh, you might get a situation where you'll never really talk to other people at all. I barely talk to my coworkers in my current job. And uh, I actually spoke to one friend of mine who I was friends with before the, the before we both had this job about uh, the interest in maybe trying to unionize, try to get collective bargaining, maybe trying to uh, put an entity on call, on call system. And uh, I didn't really like his response, which was, well, it depends on the specifics, which I interpreted as a gentle no. So I guess that's a general <laughs> question of, uh, uh, I, I feel like um, employers have found new ways to maybe nip the whole uh, unionization thing in the bud before you can, you can even get started, and I was curious about what you thought about how we can maybe try to work around that. Thank you. Okay, so we have three more speakers on the list, so I'm going to try to go to these. I know they're taking the questions down here, and then we'll come back to the, to the panel. Yes, you can go to Barry. Uh, come back to the panel for their response. But before I do that, is there anybody else that would like to speak? I have to. Okay, so I will come back for another round then. Okay, so Barry, three minutes. Yeah, I'm a member of OSSTF, unfortunately, and uh, <laughs> Federal Secretary of Socialist Action. I'm proudly proud to say that. We begin with the assertion the Winnipeg general strike was not a mistake, despite what anyone uh, on the left may say about it now. So I begin with a question Why did the general strike? happened in Winnipeg first and not elsewhere. Now, Brian began to answer that question, but I, I think there's a sociological aspect, which some uh, writers have alluded to. That is that there was a younger workforce, uh, a weaker labor bureaucracy, uh, and despite the absence of a united revolutionary party, it was a weaker link in the chain. I'm wondering, do you agree with, with that assessment? May 1919, were they ready? Well, they discussed, they voted, and that's how they got ready. I mean, someone presented the perspective and they discussed it in workplace after workplace and they uh, resolved to take uh, successive actions and more and more groups of workers joined. In Ontario, uh, I hearken back to the fight against uh, the Mike Harris Conservatives. Uh, there were strikes in uh, 10 or 11 cities, general strikes in 10 or 11 cities. Some were stronger uh, and, and more powerful and, and, and broader than in others. But I think about the one in, that occurred in Toronto, October 25th, 1996. One million people were off the job. How did that happen? Well, um, there were many contributing factors. I'm going to mention just one, and this is about initiative, uh, being bold and being brave. Uh, a, w one of the leading members of Socialist Action, Joe Flexer, and a bunch of militants from a, of several unions went to picket the Davisville subway train yard the Friday night. And uh, sorry, the Thursday night, because uh, October 25th was a Friday. And this flying, flying picket stopped the transit workers, which meant no trains, no buses uh, 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 operated uh, on the Friday. And that, mean, that meant over a million workers 
did not report to work. Um, the next day, there were a quarter million people in the streets, filling University Avenue from Front Street right up to uh, Queens Park, and uh, co-chairing the rally was Elizabeth, <laughs> who was, I think, Secretary of Labor Council at the time. Uh, so the role of revolutionary initiative uh, is, is another factor. Um, contrast, that, contrast that to the uh, state of the discussion about um, mass, act, mass job action today. Now the Workers' Action Center, which does a lot of very good work, uh, especially around the raising the minimum wage, um, held a public meeting called Red for Ed on May 29th. Red for Ed celebrated the teacher strikes that occurred in the red states, uh, that, uh, and many of them unpredictably, overwhelmingly powerful, and told some very interesting stories. Teacher strike leaders from the USA were there. But the Workers' Action Center leaders proposed uh, picking up on one thing that the U.S. teachers said, deep organizing. 30 seconds. Deep organizing sounds a lot like what the Ontario Federation of Labor outlook is. Um, let's have tea with the neighbors and talk about how we can build actions in solidarity on the local level. But there's no political perspective. And if you push them for a political perspective, what do they say? Push the Ford government out in three years. Well, really? Well, let's remember history. A little slice of it. Mike Harris was re-elected in 1998 because the CAW pulled the plug on the Days of Action in Ontario. So if you demoralize the ranks, if you don't sustain and escalate the struggle, that can be the result. We need more than a purely economic action perspective. We need a political action perspective that culminates in the establishment of a workers' government. Yes, we have to talk about the political solution as well as the economic. So the question is not, are we ready? The question is, how do we get ready? And we get ready by escalating actions, responding to every, every attack, uh, leaving no group of workers behind. We need a new labor leadership, Wrap not up. just social unionism, but class struggle unionism that targets austerity and capitalism itself. The united front tactic to which socialist action is committed more than any other tendency on the left today. Is right that I, I was involved in, in the days of action, but more important, I was one of the ten coordinators across Ontario, which I felt very proud of putting it all together. And let's not forget, uh, my union, Canadian Union of Postal Workers, shut every post office down across Ontario. And how did we do it? Crazy glue comes in handy sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we'll move along to Jeff. I don't know. I'm exactly the midway point. First, I'd like to thank the panelists. Am I on? Yeah, yeah. you're on. Okay. Um, we just had a plenum of our party in the United States, and uh, five months earlier we had a national convention, and we passed a document called The Worldwide Crisis of Capitalism and the Relevance of Socialism Today. The truth is that the whole capital system is in crisis, more so than at any time in our lives. And they have no alternative but to take out that crisis on the heights of working people, which is what they're doing. I recall a short while ago when President Trump was ranting against socialism. He said, there'll never be socialism in the United States. I have friends, he said, in the police and the military. <laughs> now, Trump is a fucking moron. <laughs> These are not my words. These are the words of sec his Secretary of State, Rex Tillerson, <laughs> who after Trump appeared before the National Security Council and said he wanted to increase the nuclear weapons, the tactical nuclear weapons, by a hundredfold and left the room, <laughs> Tillerson said, the guy's a fucking moron. <laughs> but he's not. He is the crude example of what the entire capitalist class is thinking today. He is the representative of the ruling class when they meet in the back room and they decide to send 130,000 troops to the Middle East, or to overthrow the government of Venezuela, or kill 500,000 people in their war on Syria, and steal the resources of Africa and run 1,100 military bases around the world. This is a sick, diseased system that kills millions every day. 
King Leopold killed 12 million in the Congo, but he only got to steal the rubber and ivory. Rockefeller and J.P. Morgan got all the mineral rights. That's why when Mark Twain wrote his book, King Leopold's Ghost, he denounced this imperialist bastard. Brian hit it on the head. We know exactly who the class enemy is, the most powerful the world has ever seen. And the only way we can defeat it is to mobilize the working class to challenge for power. And the only way we can do that is to build a, in Brian's words, a deeply rooted mass revolutionary party that takes up every issue that is relevant to working class life and life on the planet. That's our task. That's why we're in this room. That's why if you're a young person, you should join the revolutionary movement. If we go home and continue to just talk and not act, not be central leaders of every union, of every struggle. We had 400 out for Mumia. We've been leading that fight for 25 years. It's central because we have 7 million people under the racist system of mass incarceration in the United States. And young people know that. I want to say this. 30 seconds. No revolutionary can ever predict that moment when it's going to happen. That's right. Yeah. A bunch of women who were telephone workers sparked it. We had a general strike in Oakland in 1946 because three women were picketing and got beaten up hotel workers and representatives of the Labor Council protested. They were attacked and they closed down the city of Oakland in 1946 and elected a working class government. Right. Lenin was rowing a boat in Switzerland at the time of the October Revolution. He gave a speech to college students said, you're the future, I'm too old, I'm not gonna be around to lead the revolution. And a bunch of women in St. Petersburg. 30 seconds, Jeff. Who were hungry in the middle of an imperialist war, organized a, a demonstration, and they were attacked, and that was the spark for the Russian Revolution. But only because there was a revolutionary party in preparation. Yes. <coughs> Every revolution that you analyze will ask the question, what was the leadership about? How deeply ingrained were there, and how close was their program to meeting the needs of the working class that day and for the future? Thank you. Hans? I guess I'll have to stand up too, Deb. <laughs> um, as dynamic and as inspiring as Sid Ryan's enthusiastic presentation was, um, it kidnapped the agenda. We are actually now talking from Yellow West to Workers' Revolt. <laughs> and allow me to go back to 1919, as Brian uh, set out to do. In a month, I hope to be in Munich. And if there was a disease called Winnipegitis, uh, it had a very severe uh, consequence in Munich in 1919 because in November of 1918, a Jewish literati, editor of the Forwärts, the SPD, uh, Social Democratic Organ, seized the moment of the soldiers returning home, usually armed with their rifles, and declared Bavaria a republic, ousted the king, of Bavaria, set up a cabinet of various and sundry socialists, um, centrists we would call them today. Kurt Eisner, I mentioned, was a Jewish socialist, just like Samuel Blumenberg was in Winnipeg. To echo yesterday's topic, Socialism was very prominently led by Jewish intellectuals who had rejected the faith, the religion, and had become Marxists. 
1919 started in a dismal fashion in the German-speaking world with the slaughter on January 15th of Rosa Luxemburg and Liebknecht. And they committed the sin, if you pardon that, of not following in Lenin's footsteps for various reasons. But the even bigger sin was that the Bolsheviks in Germany were reformists. They had succumbed to the war hysteria of the Kaiser, and they had disarmed socialism, which was pregnant all over Europe, of its proudest moment. Not in our lifetime, but a hundred years ago, socialism had its most prodigious presence all over the, the world. And we have lost a century. And who were the agents of that defeat? Ironically, it was the reformist social democrats. Ebert Noske, Noske who was the war minister in the service of the imperial Germans. So the death seconds. agony of capitalism, as we called it in my days in the LSA, was never more evident than in 1919, not my lifetime. I think we should take healthy stock of where we are and why we are here. And we should take inspiration of the fact that capitalism is facing a new death agony, self-imposed, the struggle for the survival of civilization in the context of climate change. New forces will come to the fore. New forces that, like we have seen the sudden transformation of Jagmeet Singh into a green turban, <laughs> uh, we'll have to follow the mass movement. We'll have to follow the students. And my time is up. But we are in a struggle where the death agony of capitalism will be more evident. And the task for us is to propagandize a socialist alternative, despite all the degenerations. And let us not forget the word Nazi means National Socialist German Workers' Party. The crucible of fascism was shed in the blood in the streets in 1919 in May in Munich under the heels of the Social Democratic Central Government of Berlin that slaughtered the revolution in Bavaria. Thank you. Thank you the chair I just have two more speakers so I'm going to go to them come back to the panel and give them each 10 minutes to do their uh, wrap up and sort of cover some of the questions that was asked so and so the speakers list is closed except the two speakers I'm going to and that's Rosemary and Comrade Gamble. I'm just gonna pass because as a, as a comrade here pointed out this is uh, already more into discussion of the of the the next afternoon session with my comments are more in that. Uh, okay. So I'll All right. So the com yes, Comrade Gavon. Thank you. Uh, I'm Aurea from uh, the New Anti-Capitalist Party in France. Um, I think the uh, I think the discussion the discussion is very interesting. Um, for uh, first, uh, contrary to a common idea in France, um, a major struggles took place in the history of uh, North America. And uh, Canada and the uh, United States are um, two countries with a great history of a struggle in a uh, working class. And I think it's very important that uh, in the working class in France, we, exp we explain this and uh, we, we, uh, we have to learn to, uh, to your, uh, form your history. Uh, next, I think the discussion, the discussion shows the relevance of the strategy 
of the general strike for the fight for socialism. Um, the general strike, the general strike is the only way to uh, put a stop to the capitalist policies. Um, and uh, bureaucratic leaderships today uh, refuse uh, to organize to organize a unity. Um, for example, in France, uh, last month, uh, the Congress of the of the CGT, uh, it's a more most important uh, trade union in France. Uh, the the Congress of the CGT took took place, and uh, Philippe Martinez, uh, the leader of the CGT, uh, he says, "We want to federate the struggle," but in fact, they refuse to uh, uh, give the ways to organize this uh, convergence between the the different struggles, uh, and. Uh, the, the discourse of the leaders of the, the unions is uh, we, we, we want general strike but uh, uh, you, are not, uh, you are not ready for the general strike. Uh, but uh, in fact they refuse to organize the mobilization for general strike. For example, uh, today uh, many struggles uh, uh, happen in France uh, in different sectors. Uh, for example, uh, the youth uh, with uh, students, uh, the teachers, the, ri the railway sector, the ri railway sectors, uh, strikes in the postal service, etc. But um, uh, leaderships of the trade unions. Uh, isolate, isolate each sector, uh, and they uh, they refuse to to organize the, the unity uh, between these different sectors. And uh, I think uh, uh, regroup uh, these different struggles is the most the most important task uh, the most Im important task for the revolutionaries today, and we cannot uh, wait that the leadership of the trade unions uh, do it. Uh, and, and I think uh, today the greatest, the greatest weakness of the um, revolutionary left is uh, his her inability to uh, regroup all the, the activists who support the idea of the general strike. And I think uh, is the most important task for us today. Thank you. It's okay, YC, and thank you very much for being our roving mic. Now we're going to go back to the panel. Okay, so we're going to start with uh, Gary and then Brian, and you have up to 10 minutes each. Thank you, well, thank you, Sister Chair, Comrade Chair. Can't hear you, Gary. Oh, that's well, sorry, the mic is not on. That's, that, that's uh, our sound man. He's okay, just taking a little break. One, two, one, two. Uh, yep. Okay. First of all, let me reiterate what Bob Lyons said, that the labor leadership today is stands across the path to the revolution. They, uh, they support capitalism. Um, they see only struggles within capitalism. They see them union by union or local by local. They say the workers aren't ready, but it's their job. It's the job of the of the workers, leaders of workers, to get them ready. Yes. So everything they say that's wrong is something they're doing. <laughs> uh, <laughs> like uh, the workers aren't ready. The uh, you know the conflict within the unions, which they initiate. Uh, you know. <laughs> You know, the, the community wouldn't support us. That's because they don't do any work in the communities. They don't teach about the importance of unionism. And they, they say, well, we represent a smaller and smaller percentage. And that's because they refuse to go out and, and organize campaigns to organize the unorganized. So they are, as Bob explained, the agents of the ruling class in the, in the, in the unions. Uh, there are many of them who would deny that. I mean, they may not even think of themselves as doing that, but that's, 
as Bob said, we're, it's, we're not throwing epithets around. We're looking at the objective role of the labor leadership as it stands today in the working class, and they represent capitalism. Um, and they will take violent action against socialists who try to displace them. Uh, uh, Barry Weisletter was attacked by, th by thugs, hired security guards who were thugs, uh, when he tried to distribute a leaflet to a union. And more and more we see NDP meetings and labor meetings hiring private security firms to do their dirty work and exclude any other voice from the NDP meetings or from um, or from union meetings. So we have to, one, one little thing, we have to really protest that. I mean, the vo the, all the tendencies in the working class, all of the voices of, of workers, including the revolutionary voice, has a right to be heard. We are part of the working class. Uh, a very effective, uh, the fight has to start among other things, with the fight for simple democracy in the trade unions. Um, uh, my father was a Teamster, and he was a member of a caucus called Teamsters for Democracy. Now, he, he fought the Hoffa leadership, which was a dangerous thing to do. Um, but he also hated the Kennedys. He knew the Kennedys were, were uh, rich, and they were trying to destroy his union. So, I mean, it was, it's, you know, unions understand the concept of democratic centralism. Uh, you fight like hell within the union for uh, democracy and for a militant program, but you support the union against the capitalists. So um, that, that's another uh, element here. Um, I think um, the, the point about the Winnipeg strike and the kind of leadership they had, yes, the lessons of Marx, uh, of, of Lenin and Trotsky, hadn't yet, had not had time to permeate throughout the world and the working class. It wasn't that they were inferior leaders, they just had, they, we just weren't at that stage in Canada. Uh, and they later, the early Communist Party was of course a revolutionary party uh, when it was formed in 1921 in Canada. Um, the, um, the ND, I want to say a few words about the uh, the NDP. The NDP, the NDP is a labor party. It's based on the trade unions. But I, I want us to understand the NDP. The NDP is led by a class collaborationist, class traitor leadership, and their program is a reform capitalist, mild reforms of the capitalist system. Um, and they are using more and more anti-democratic means within the NDP to fight against anybody who opposes them. They refuse to let people who support BDS run as candidates. Now I was called, God knows why, by somebody in Jugmeet Singh's office asking if they could use my home in, in uh, Victoria for a fundraiser for Jugmeet Singh. And I said, I can't do it because I'm going to a BDS demonstration. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, by the way, just a couple of days before, Manley had won. The Green Party had taken the writing of Nanaimo away from the NDP, and you guys threw him out because he supported BDS. And she said, I don't think that's going to happen anymore, but we'll see. We'll see. <laughs> Uh, but you know, the Socialist Caucus is the only socialist opposition to the NDP leadership. And this is crucial because what we're talking about here is the political, the organization and the union level and the political expression of it is all that Winnipeg is all about. And the Socialist Caucus is the only organized socialist opposition. And we're the only ones who actually run slates against the leadership because we want to demonstrate that this leadership has got to go. Yes. It's not just we want to win this pro programmatic point or that programmatic point. When I was running for treasurer, and I was more qualified than the right-wing candidate because I'm a <laughs> retired chartered accountant, um, <laughs> the, uh, I said, you can fight for all the reforms you want, and then you will get out of parliament, and the next real bourgeois party will come in and they'll take them all back. And that goes on and on and on. You've got to change the system. And I got a little huge applause because people understood that very simple idea 
that ref reformism doesn't work. You can make gains, but now Medicare is under attack. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and you know some of the most fundamental gains the working class has made just end up under attack. So um, you know we are carrying on that we are the only ones carrying on an organized fight against the NDP leadership. Uh, and and do we think the NDP will lead the revolution? Absolutely not. That's why independently of all that, we're building socialist action publicly. We produce our own newspaper and carry on all kinds of actions independently of the NDP. We we are not deluded by the by the notion the NDP will ever lead the revolution. But it is where the most class conscious workers are today, and the whole idea is that that Brian was saying is you've got to find a way in the revolutionary left to connect with the workers. And we also connect with BDS, we connect with the anti-imperialist fight and the, the, the communities that are associated with that, the Venezuelans and, and Latin Americans in Toronto and all that kind of thing. I'm working assiduously to try to develop indigenous connections because we need indigenous Bolsheviks in Canada. And, um, um, and uh, there's a pamphlet <laughs> <laughs> Pamphlet written by yours truly on the indigenous uh, struggle and the way forward in Canada. So uh, I'm just going to leave it on that point that, 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 you know, we can't jump over our own heads. We are a small organization and we're, we have to work assiduously in many fields and build it. First of all, uh, you know, sl as, as fast as we can, but we can't do more than we can do. And we'll do everything we can do. So come along, join with us, build the leadership we need. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gary. Okay, um, again, there have been a lot of uh, great and probing questions, and I'll try to speak generally and hopefully touch on some of them. I would like to uh, in some sense, I add a voice of affirmation to the to the point made by the comrade here in the black beret, and because enough is not said about it, it and it is to be critical in some senses of the revolutionary leadership of of 1919, in that one of the the key problems was they did not really have a well developed understanding of the state and its repressive capacity, and a kind of programmatic programmatic direction. Um, and uh, they paid a, an immense price for that, the, the leadership. Um, on the other hand, uh, and this relates to uh, Barry's point about why Winnipeg, um, I think one of the reasons that the, the strike happened in Winnipeg, it, it did relate to the, to the demography of the workforce, uh, it related to the, the, the sort of uh, combined and uneven development of Canadian capitalism at the time in the sense that Winnipeg had telescoped into probably two or three decades the capitalist development that for instance had taken place in Toronto over the course of almost a century. This accelerated pace of capitalist development then accelerated and accentuated the, the sort of character of capitalist exploitation, uh, the toll and tribute exacted from, uh, sort of from proletarianization, etc. Um, so, you had a, a young, you had a, 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 a working class that was composed of, in some senses, the most advanced sectors of capitalism, concentrated in the railway shops, where, where Winnipeg was a, a kind of a, an entrepot of, of developing capitalism in terms of the connection between the capitalist industry of, the, of central Canada and the developing West and the the, the rail shops were the, were the kind of link there between that national development, which was, you know, centered in a national policy of the 1870s. Um, but you also had a, a, a working class that was also uh, immigrant and unorganized. And the most advanced sectors of the most advanced capitalist industry were people, were, were personalized in people like R.B. Russell, who was a, a socialist, an advocate of one big union, the animating idea of one big union, which was more than the, the organization of the OBU, which, which was always a, a, a sort of pale reflection of the idea of one big unionism, which this mythology of the capacity of one big union to organize all the workers 
um, this gave the labor movement a, a you know a, a sort of galvanizing idea. When we look around, what's the galvanizing idea of the labor movement today? I mean, because of the problems of leadership that we've been talking about and the issues that Sid Ryan addressed. I mean, there is no galvanizing leadership except, you know, business unionism, dues into our coffers, you know, uh, we'll get what we can out of a, you know, a, a system that's basically collapsing, of which Unifor and Diaz are, 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 are the articulation now. I mean, the notion that this can be seen as a fight back when you negotiate for 300 jobs, which are largely white collar jobs, as I understand it, are they not? Of, a, of thousands of jobs that are disappearing. And you, you know, you cast your lot with the Liberal Party in order to get you that, that great victory of saving 300 jobs. And then you campaign in the midst of a, of, of a, of, of a, you know, a, 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 the, of international capital saying we're closing this plant. And your response is to basically beg the liberals to take on a Trump kind of orientation and introduce tariffs against Mexican-made cars. I mean, this is a reflection of just the bankruptcy of the, of the, of the contemporary trade union leadership. And let's, let us not forget that, 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 that you know, Unifor in its CAW guise of the 1980s was probably the most militant union. In Canada, so you see the capacity of a trade union leadership to go to drive backwards in the auto sector at a very, very accelerating rate, and again, that should raise all kinds of questions. Um, so there's, you know, there are reasons why Winnipeg, um, and there were problems with 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 that that revolutionary leadership. Um, I think they 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 underestimated the capacity of repression of the state, um, but on the other hand. That revolutionary leadership uh, was more, far more embedded in the working class and far more wide-reaching in terms of its capacities to uh, influence workers um, in 1919 than anything we are you know, close to experiencing today. Um, and that speaks to a lot of the questions about, you know, which, I, which were raised about what does one do if you're working in a sector that isn't organized. Um, let's not forget, many of those, the vast bulk of those immigrant workers in Winnipeg were working in those small shops that were un largely unorganized. Now, I agree again with the, the point made by our, our friend here that, that uh, you know, ca contemporary capitalism has all kinds of capacities to fragment and fracture work, to create uh, basically uh, you know, work environments that are that isolate people from one another, uh, that keep workers apart from one another, that don't reproduce the the problems of the large factory where you know bottlenecks of workers can tie up production, not only yeah. in one factory but in you know the 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 whole Fordist econ economy. A lot of what we see in, in how contemporary work is organized is a, is a reaction against that, and it's, it's work sectors that kind of defy that. However, this is the point about those immigrant workers that worked in those isolating small shop, uh, often art, artisanal kind of, uh, you know, garment trade industries in, in Winnipeg in, 19, in, in 1919. They didn't have unions, but they had the revolutionary left. They, had, they were members of the Social Democratic Party or they were members of the Socialist Party of Canada. Um, this Blumenberg man that I mentioned, he was a, a leading agitator uh, of, the, of the Socialist Party of Canada. So one can join the revolutionary left and be a part of that and connect to people in other work sectors and use, and use that kind of influence. And then it isn't necessarily organizing a union is great but you but the way one can function even in a non-organized work sector can often be quite you know can often be quite important and can and can and can push and promote the ideas of solidarity and collectivity and also that will be the way that international connections are made it is through the revolutionary left I would argue more so than the trade union movement. The trade union movement and its internationalism will almost always take place in a very top-down, almost bureaucratic manner. But the revolutionary left 
can develop internationalism and translate that into working class sectors, into trade unions in ways that I, I would say the, the sort of established and ensconced trade union bureaucracy cannot. And it can create the kinds of left caucuses in unions across borders that link up with various uh, causes and campaigns and, and promote that. Um, on the whole question of the general strike, um, I think this is, this is a, a fundamental issue. And it, it is not so much that the, the argument will always be that the workers aren't ready for the general strike. That's what you're always going to get from a trade union leadership. And in the two moments that I've been involved in potential general strikes, the, the largest and the most uh, exhilarating and, the, and in some senses the most debilitating in its ultimate demise was the solidarity agitation in British Columbia in 1983, which was a massive mobilization, a groundswell from the bottom up. Uh, and, there were, and, the, and the left was there saying build a general strike from day one, forcing the bureaucracy to, to sort of promise a general strike that of course is always timetabled. <laughs> it's always timetabled. But then uh, the denouement of that, which, which was Jack Monroe appearing on, you know, the Premier's patio in Kelowna, B.C., and terminating a general strike, was one of the most sorry demises. Uh, and uh, one minute. unlike Winnipeg, it took the, the left and the unions in B.C. a long time to bounce back from that. But it was an exhilarating, it was an exhilarating struggle, and it, it revealed, and I wrote a book about it, Solidarity, the Rise and Fall of an Opposition in British Columbia, it did reveal, also, the challenges for the revolutionary left. Not only social democracy do, do we, do, not only do we live on the revolutionary left with the yoke of social democracy around our, our necks, we live on the revolutionary left in the modern period with the yoke of Stalinism which, although it's no longer in existence in the Soviet Union, ha indeed has soured, you know, socialism in the mouths of millions of people around the world. This is a, a very difficult struggle. So there are many, many challenges and programmatic issues that the revolutionary left has to address today that relate to 1919 and the long aftermath of 1919. But unless that, that revolutionary left is regrouped and rebuilt, my view is that the trade unions cannot be rebuilt and, 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 and regrouped around democratic, militant, class struggle politics. And without that, all the other social movements are impoverished. Because without a class perspective, all the other social, all the other social movements, whatever they are, will not have the sort of power, the working class power as, the, as, as, as something they can possibly align with and can enrich their struggles, and they will not have the critical input that comes from a class struggle politics that's premised uh, both in the revolutionary left and in, in, in the trade unions. So it's, it's a long, difficult, and protracted struggle, but the one thing that drives this forward is there is no alternative to this politics. There is no alternative Capitalism is in, is, 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 is in deep crisis. It was, by the 1930s, it was pregnant with the need for a revolutionary opposition. It was overripe then. It is a carcass now <laughs> that we all are kind of, you know, fighting to sort of liberate ourselves from. Thank you. Yeah. A special thanks to, to Brian and to Sid Ryan, of course, as well as our own comrade Gary. Okay, and thank you all for coming, and hopefully you will all be back at 4 o'clock. It's, it's now 10 after